Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear a delightfully gay comedy from the London stage, The Policeman and the Lady, the light-headed, light-hearted tale of America's richest woman who hunted husbands on a Mediterranean island and wound up with more men than she could handle. Starring tonight, you will hear Melbourne artists Mary Disney and Keith Eden. <laughs> The Caltex Theatre presents The Policeman and the Lady, Act One. Da -da -dee, da -da 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 -da. Oh, Bill, this place is heaven. The island, the blue Mediterranean at our garden wall. Soft summer nights. Yes, and paying guests appearing like clockwork whenever a man tries to kiss his wife. Oh, now, darling, don't harp. One paying guest, and man is very tactful. But, Vicky, whatever gave you the notion, we needed to take in lodgers. After all, a lieutenant's pay isn't to be sneezed at these days. Well, darling, I've told you. To begin with, I was glad of the company with you and your old destroyer expected to be away three months. How was I to know you'd come back in three weeks? Well, now I have. How about dropping Myrna a gentle hint? How can I? Just think of the effect on Anglo-American relations. Well, I'm more interested in the effect on ours. Darling, we've only been married four months. Yes, I know. Oh, it's perfectly amazing. What is? Heredity. Now there's you. Sweet and lovable, but essentially foolish. Thank you. And yet you spring from the union of the toughest egg in the British Navy and a glamorous French portion with a high consumption rate of husbands. Well, the faults weren't all on Mother's side. Daddy can be pretty overpowering at times. Oh, as you're telling me. Why, well, I say, he's not likely to drop in us from the skies again, is he? Oh, you never know with Daddy. He might. Well, if he does, I'll turn him loose on Myrna. Yes, that's what I'll do. It'd serve you right if she became your stepmother. Bill, don't harp. All right, all right. <laughs> well, they must have been a picturesque pair, your mama and papa. What was the actual cause of the split all those years ago? He tried to make her a rugger fan. Well, say no more. I'm on her side from <laughs> now on. What's more, I'd like to meet her. You will one of these days, I expect. She's always on the move, leaving a trail of debts behind her. But she looks and smells divine. Which reminds me. Come here. Huh? Oh, divine. <laughs> oh, darling. Mm. I'm glad I'm back. Mm. Oh. Uh, okay. oh! Oh, shall I turn round and go out again? <laughs> no, of course not. Come in, Myrna. Enjoyable walk? Yes, very. Oh, the basket looks heavy. Did you carry it all the way from the bus? As a matter of fact, no. I met a melatosin policeman and he walked all the way with me. His manners were beautiful. As a matter of fact, I'd have asked him in. Oh, why didn't you? Well, I wasn't sure how your husband would take it. Me? The naval garrison don't meet up socially with the melatosins. I can they? tell by your voice that you think we're all snobs. Oh, no, just pretty. No, wouldn't you like a drink or something? Dinner shouldn't be long. No, thanks, Victoria. I won't spoil my thirst. Uh, there are two bottles of Paul Roger 43 in the basket. Oh, I say, what's a celebration? Well, I guess you could call it a celebration. As a matter of fact, I'm leaving you tomorrow. What? Oh, but why? A change in my plans, that's all. I've decided to go to Naples. Unless, of course, it's inconvenient because I could stay a little longer. Wouldn't hear of it. Bill! <laughs> that's all right, Victoria. We'll both be very sorry to see you go. Oh, rather. And so will Captain Pittsbing. I doubt that. His ship came in this morning and he sent a note asking if he might call. Not to see me, I imagine. But he's a friend of yours, isn't he? He was. Shall I put the champagne on ice? No, don't bother. Ring for Carmilla, Bill. Yes, all right. I'll just go and freshen up. Why, well, I say the Paul 43 was a nice touch. Thanks, Manor. You're welcome. I hope you're ashamed. Well, she is nice. 
I'm almost sorry she's going, uh, but not quite. That was odd about Captain Pitts Bing. You ring, Signora? Hello, who's this? Oh, Carmela's little sister. She comes in to help when we have company. Where's Carmela, Tony? She's sick. Oh, poor Carmela. She is very sick. She is lying on the kitchen table. Oh, dear. Well, I'll come and see. Uh, just take those bottles out of the basket and put them on ice. Si, sí, Signora. Oh, see who that is, will you, Bill? Come along, Tony. What on earth could have happened to poor Carmela? Mm, probably eaten some of her own pastry. Oh, good evening, Captain Pittsbing. Uh, good evening, Drake. Well, come in, sir. You're expected. Uh, thank you, Drake. Thank you. Your wife's home, I trust? Mm, oh, yes. Uh, she's just gone to deal with the domestic crisis. Oh, nothing serious, I trust. Uh, so do I, if we're going to get any dinner. Uh, well, this way, sir. Uh, would you have a drink? Uh, uh, not just now, thank you. Oh, Bill. Oh, good evening, Captain Pittsbing. Good evening, my dear Mrs. Drake. Excuse me one moment. Bill, you'd better take Carmilla home in the car. My maid, Captain, I'm really quite worried about her. Oh, I see. Bill? Right. Excuse me, sir. I shan't be long. Uh, right. Well, now I can say how do you do politely. Do sit down, Captain. Uh, thank you, no. Uh, <clears throat> is something wrong? Oh, no, no. Yeah, the, the fact is, Mrs. Drake, uh, well, I wonder if you remember a conversation we had at the Blinkensop's cocktail party. You spoke of inviting a few people on a, a paying footing. Oh, yes, I remember. Ah, uh, well, the fact is, I've strongly recommended your house to a, a friend of mine. Oh, that's very kind of you, Captain Pittsbing, but you see... Uh, a lady, a very charming lady. I met her at Monte Carlo. I feel sure you'll both get along splendidly. Oh, but wait. I'm terribly sorry, but you see, I expected that Bill would be away for three months. But now he's come back. Naturally, I've changed my mind. Changed your mind? Yes. But, my dear Mrs. Drake, this places me in a dilemma. At this hour and in this season... I don't understand. Well, I absolutely counted on getting her in here, and it's a bit late to go looking somewhere else. You see, I've uh, brought her along with me. You mean she's waiting outside? In the car. Well, then I suppose you must bring her in. It, it looks so rude. Just one night, I promise you. I'll go and fetch well, her. Captain Pitts being one moment... Well, just for well... one night. Oh, thank you, Cherie. My apologies for keeping you waiting so long. Now come along in and meet Mrs. Drake. Oh, a pleasure. Oh, a most charming place it is. <gasps> oh, why? It... Uh, this is your Mrs. Drake. <laughs> Mrs. Drake, may I introduce the Comtesse de Saint Savin? But it, it's a bingo. Uh... My brooch. I have lost it. Please look in the car for me. Oh, oh, uh, very well, Louise. Wait. Oh, he is gone. Oh, Victoria. <laughs> is it really you? All the time he say, Mrs. Drake this and Mrs. Drake that, and I never even thought of you. Such an agricultural name. Mother, what on earth are you doing here? Darling. <laughs> Please, I am not your mother. But you are. Oh, Bettice, of course I am, but not in front of Bingo. Bingo? Oh, you mean Captain Pittsbing? He is, uh, how shall I say, um, attracted to me, but not to the mother of a daughter of your age. Oh, quickly, he comes. Oh, we have met before, in Paris. I'm afraid I can't find it, Louise. What, Bingo? Your brooch. Well, what about it? Oh, Bingo, I have met an old friend. Oh, I say, how perfectly splendid. Didn't I tell you you'd get on like a house on fire, Mrs. Drake? <laughs> Uh, you've explained to the Countess that our servant is ill? Oh, please, no formality. Call me Louise. After all, we are uh, old friends. <gasps> Mon dieu, my nerves. That'll be Bill. He always bangs it. You will excuse me, uh, Louise, won't you? Oh, certainly, certainly. Make your uh, explanations. That was the idea. Well, help yourself to drinks, Captain Pittsbing. Oh, thank you. And please call me Wilfred. It's my name. Oh. Well, I think I prefer Bingo. Thank you. I won't be long. Bingo. Such a charming young woman. Yes, isn't she? And she is good looking. You and she are alike, you know. Impossible. I mean, you possess the same type of rare beauty. Oh, yes, that is possible. <laughs> Bingo. I suppose I must stay here for the night, but I am not happy here. Well, don't you worry your pretty head, girlie. Tomorrow I'll find something really lovely. Oh. <laughs> Oh. oh, I beg your pardon. Good evening, Miss Van Stooten. Oh, I'm sorry, I had no idea. Oh, but come in, please. Louise, may I introduce Miss Myrna Van Stooten from America? Miss Van Stooten, the Countess de saint Savard. John! Oh, I'm very glad to meet you, Countess. I have a great admiration for the French. They have something which we do not yet possess. Culture. And you Americans have something which we no longer possess. Money. Some of us. <laughs> not all, Countess. That is a common illusion, but one which the captain no longer cherishes. Isn't that so, Captain? 
Quite. Come and be introduced, Bill. Oh, yes, delighted. Contest, this is Bill, my husband. Oh, charming, charming. The pleasure is mine. Oh, Victoria has excellent taste. Well, that's nice of you to say so. Uh, your wife has explained this uh, intrusion. My wife has told me everything. Ah, you've met the Contest, Myrna? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry about dinner. Bill and I will have to get it. Carmela's really quite sick. I'll help you. Oh, thanks, Myrna, but we can manage. Oh, we'll soon need the light. It's getting quite dark. What is that? Oh, it's a plane of some sort. I say, it's getting mighty close. Sounds like a helicopter. Helicopter? Great Scott, sounds as if it's right over the roof. I'm afraid it is. It's probably my father. Your father? The Admiral coming here? Oh, he dropped in on us by helicopter once before. Well, it's the Admiral, all right. He's landed right on the roof. Uh, would you like to come up and meet him, sir? Uh, those stairs lead to the roof. Oh, rather. Always happy to meet the Admiral, my dear chap. Victoria, I must go to my room at once. That noise, it has brought on my migraine. Wait, uh, excuse us, Myrna. Uh, of course. Once before, when Daddy visited us, he stayed the night. My migraine lasts the night. Oh, quickly, take me to my room. All right, uh, this way. Uh, good night, Miss Van Schuten. Oh, good night, Cardis. Oh, first nine in the morning, Jinkies. Aye, aye, sir. Pretty well, thank you, sir. And you, sir? Busy as a bee. Not enough time to get proper exercise. Hmm. Hmm. Whom have we here? Oh, Miss Van Steuten, my father-in-law, Admiral Masterman. Admiral Sir Lancelot Masterman. I'm very glad to meet you. Uh, how do you do? Uh, where's my daughter? Oh, she was here, sir. With... I'll give her a call. Vicky! Just coming. Oh, Victoria, there you are. Daddy, darling. Oh, what a nice surprise. Are you staying long? Uh, just a flying visit one night. Oh, that's good. Just a flying visit. Literally almost. <laughs> uh, it got dark so suddenly, I only just made it. Yes, you did cut it fine. I was just going to tell them why when you came in. Uh, where was I? Getting riled with a policeman for doing his duty. Hmm. Well, you can't put it that way, I suppose. He said it was a deliberate insult to his nation or some such thing. Wouldn't listen to my apologies, so I flew away again. And here I am. Daddy, your room's all ready. Same one as last time. That's a good girl. Oh, don't miss stuff. Well, this way. Dinner's only scratch, I'm afraid. Our maid's gone sick. Perfectly all right, my dear. So, that is a British admiral. Tough baby, isn't he? Oh, I'm sorry for that policeman. Well, how do you mean? He'll be running around here to apologise as soon as his headquarters get to hear of it. Oh, I wonder who that can be. Well, probably the policeman come to apologise. Oh, I doubt that. The admiral's a fast worker, but not as fast as that. I think it's the policeman come to arrest the admiral. Go on, Bill, let him in. Right. Uh, visitors, eh? Sounds like it, son. Well, we aren't expecting anybody. Are you, Myrna? I'm not entirely sure yet. Oh, good evening, senor. Well, come in, won't you? Well, look, it's the policeman. Great Scott! Yes, he's right here, Major. Come through. Oh, thank you, senor. Why, it's my policeman. I'm uh, very pleased to see you again, senorina. Uh, this is Major Salvatore. Major Eduardo Fernando Salvatore at your service. Uh, you will excuse the formality, but this is an official visit, senora, senorina. Won't you sit down, Major? Uh, thank you, no, Signora. Uh, my business is with you, sir. Uh, well, I gathered that. I have come to take you to the magistrate's court, which is in special session to deal with your case. What? If you would be good enough to come quietly, it would save the company any unpleasantness. You good mean Lord, you're a Are you serious, man? This is outrageous. I presume you know who I am. I do, sir. You are the person who has twice broken the law by landing on the top of a house. This is Admiral Sir Lancelot Masterman, my good man. Then he should know that the laws of a country are to be obeyed. Good God. You're very sure of yourself, Major Salvatore. It is in my business to be well acquainted with the law of the land and to show no favor in its administration. Then allow me to inform you that the law you've quoted does not apply to myself. Aha, uh -huh, sir. Here, take a look at this. Thank you. You'll observe that it's signed personally by your Minister of the Interior. Yes, I see that. You did not see fit to acquaint me of its contents when you alighted on my house top. You didn't give me much chance, Major. There is nothing else to be said. Your letter, sir? I express my regrets for having interrupted your social hour. Very properly, too. And another time, perhaps you'll not be so quick to assume disrespect for the laws of your country. Another time, Admiral, if another time should arise, I shall be very careful. Very careful indeed. Signore? Signorina? I shall see you to the door. Uh, thank you, Signore. 
But how did you get the law to make an exception of you, sir? Uh, good lunch at the club, a uh, half crown cigar and a slap on the back. Yeah, well, that's that. I must say I admired his cheek, and even more the way he took a licking. The Admiral is generous in his victory. I really should look at the dinner. Uh, Mrs. Drake, it's uh, quite some time since I saw the Countess. Oh, yes, I forgot to tell you. She has a bad headache and decided to go to bed. She sent her love. Oh, well, in that case, I think I'd better be on my way. Oh, must you? Well, I'm afraid so. If I may, I'll come out tomorrow morning, and if she's better, take her to an hotel. Goodbye, Miss Van Sluten. Goodbye, Mrs. Drake. Goodbye, sir. I'll let you out. Goodbye, Captain Pittsbing. Ah, oh, goodbye. Uh, Miss Van Sluten, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you give me the impression that you think I behaved badly to that young man. I'll admit it freely, Admiral. I think you should be ashamed of yourself. Indeed. If that statement had come from anyone else but the richest young woman in the world, it would have resulted in a rapid termination of the conversation. Oh, you know who I am. I had the pleasure of meeting you at a reception in Washington some years ago. Oh, please don't give me away to the people here. They don't know? No, and I don't want them to. Oh, it's such a blessed relief to be treated as an ordinary person. In any case, I'm leaving tomorrow. Ah, so someone has found you out, have they? Yes. I was recognized by a press photographer this afternoon. It'll be all over the island by tomorrow, so there's no point in staying. Oh, dressing gong, I must go. Please remember what I asked you, Admiral. It's a promise. Uh, it isn't. It can't be. <coughs> Good God. Oh, my poor, poor Lancelot, how you have aged. <laughs> well, Louise? You are not surprised to see me after all these years? I've had a word with Victoria. Aha. Uh -huh. Apparently you haven't changed in the slightest. She is charming, is she not, our little Victoria? She's a little beauty, just like you when I first met you. Oh. Oh, but who has been teaching you to make pretty speeches? Well, uh, I said what was in my mind, that's all. You've worn rather well, I must say. And you, my dear, have improved with age, like a vintage wine or a cheese. <laughs> Louise, do you intend to marry this, this Pitts Bing fella? Why do you want to know? Well, nothing to do with me, of course, but uh, you're hard up. I am absolutely stony broke. Ah, I thought so. What about your rich second husband? He was rich when I married him. Poor Charles. He was taken from me. Very sad. I've no idea. By a bubble dancer from the Folies Bergère. <laughs> After that, it was hand to mouth. Well, you look tolerably well clothed for a penniless woman. My total assets, I have lost everything else. Yes, but what makes you think you'll be happy with that prick of a chap? Why, well, he's nothing but a careerist. And when he finds out how you've tricked him about Victoria... Oh, Lancelot, you are jealous of bingo. Me? Rubbish. Can't I do anything, Victoria? Oh, Bill's helping me, thanks, Mum. Oh, the American girl, she knows my bingo and she is shrewd. And my migraine is coming back. If you're fool enough to think you can keep this oh, up... Oh, it... is your headache better, Connors? Worse, the pain. Oh, it is excruciating. But oh. Captain Pittsbing's gone. I will return to my room. Please do not allow anyone to disturb me. I wish to be alone with my thoughts. Oh, preposterous woman. Oh, Daddy, you two haven't been quarreling. Have you? Uh, I could do with a breather. I'll take a turn in the garden. The woman's a fool. Is something wrong? I was rather hopeful of a reunion. Oh, well. A reunion? Yes. Look, I'll explain if you promise not to tell Captain Pittsbing. Mona, the Countess is my mother. She and Daddy were divorced a long time ago. I see. Well, I hate to say anything nice about a woman behind her back, but one would never guess it from her appearance. But why keep it dark? It was her idea. Uh-huh. Captain Pitts Bing. Now I'm with you. I, uh, I don't want to be nosy, Myrna, but wasn't there, well, a, a thing between you and the captain? I mean, before he went to Monte Carlo. He wanted there to be until I applied a little test. How do you mean? I borrowed some money from him. Oh, dear. But if you were hard up, why didn't you ask me? I wasn't exactly. You see, the men I meet have a tendency to think I'm rolling in dollars just because I'm an American. Oh. So when the captain began to make a pass at me, I thought I'd better get rid of any illusions he might have on that score. So I touched him for 20 pounds. What happened? My dear, the effect was instantaneous. He curled up like a hedgehog and transferred his attentions to your mother. <laughs> did he lend you the money? Yes, he did, poor man. 
<laughs> if I'd asked him to open a jugular vein, he, he couldn't have taken it harder. <laughs> Well, he's in for a shock when he finds out how Mother stands. <laughs> oh. I'll go, shall I? Would you, thanks. I must see what Bill's doing to the dinner. Why, it's Major Salvatore. Oh, come in. Oh, thank you, Signorina. Would you be so good as to inform Lieutenant Drake that the Chief of Police wishes for a word with him? Well, uh, he's just helping his wife get dinner. Oh, when do you think they will be free? How long does it usually take a newly married couple to get dinner ready? I have no experience in these matters. Then you are not a married man? No, I'm not married. You're sure I'm not intruding? Oh, quite sure. Uh, won't you sit down? It was so kind of you to carry my basket this afternoon. I would have asked you in, but... I understand very well, Signorina. Will you have a cigarette? Oh, do you like American? Well, thank you. I'm a very great admirer of everything that is American. Now, isn't that friendly? Why do you say that? Well, because they dislike the English so much. Why? Well, you saw how they break our laws, and if we protest, they change them to suit themselves. Well, oh, I think you're too big a man to let that get you down. Signorina, you are the first English-speaking woman who has treated me as an equal. Well, as to that... I am of a fisher family. You see, in Melitosa, fishing is the only way of making a living. My father, strangely enough, was an Englishman, but my mother was a Melitosan. My father deserted my mother, but he left her enough money to send me to Bologna University. When I completed my education, I came back here and joined the Melitosan police force. I understand, but I don't think you should be so bitter. That is my nature, signorina. I have come here tonight because it is my duty according to our laws. But again, the English will make fun of me and very probably get the law changed. Law? Say, what has the Admiral done now? It is uh, nothing to do with the Admiral, but he will take charge just the same. Oh, this place is like Central Station tonight. Excuse me, I'd better go. Oh, of course, Signorina. Oh, no, sit down. I have another cigarette. I'll be right back. Uh, thank you, Signorina. Captain Pitts, Ben, back again. Man, Miss Van Stutner, what a delightful surprise that you should open the door in person. I beg your pardon. Come in. Thank you, thank you. You're looking perfectly charming, perfectly charming, if I may say so. What's happened to make me so charming since the last time we met? Uh, how long? Twenty minutes ago? My dear Miss Van Stutner. Uh, oh. You know my friend, Major Salvatore? Your what? A friend. Ah, good evening, Senor. Good gad. What's he doing here? One might equally well wonder what you are doing here, Captain. The Countess, I hear, is indisposed. Countess? Oh, oh, the Countess. Well, as a matter of fact... Oh, uh, hello. Everybody back again. Hello, Major. Oh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Lieutenant Drake. I came back to see if uh, everything was all right. You mean the Countess? Oh, she's still up in her room. Well, what's all this? A deputation? Well, is anything wrong? Oh, you again, Major Salvatore. What have I done this time? You have done nothing at all, sir. That's a change. And my business on this occasion has to do with Lieutenant and Mrs. Drake. Us? Good Lord. Well, why us? Your pardon, Signora. It affects also the other residents of this house, and I regret to say, this gentleman. I? Preposterous. Uh, first of all, I must have your names in full. It is necessary to do this in a Malatosa. Typical pettifogging obstruction. Your name, sir? Well, you know it already. Very well, uh, Masterman. Your first name? Lancelot. A lot of dash nonsense. Uh, <coughs> now you, sir? William Drake. I'm Victoria Drake. Drake. And yours, Signorina? Myrna Van Stuten. B-A-N-S-T-U-T-E-N. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> and now you, sir? Bing. Pitts Bing. Wilfred Pitts Bing. <laughs> Bing. Pitts Bing. Wilfred Pitts Bing. And I don't want any impertinent remarks about it. <laughs> Bing is spelled with a Y, is it not? How did you know that? Oh, get on with it, man. Voices. Is anything the matter? Oh, Bing. Oh, my darling, I was so lonely without you. Ha! Oh, there you are, Louise. And who is this man? Uh, the chief of police. A chief of police? Oh, oh, the pain. Help! Water! Uh, get oh. some water, Victoria. Your mother's faint. Oh! Daddy! Her mother? D did you say her mother? Lancelot, you fool! Good heavens! Her mother! <laughs> Well, who is this lady? I was not told of her presence in this house. To tell you the truth, Major, I'd forgotten it myself. Unnatural, son. In law. Bingo. Are you addressing me, madam? Oh, you see what you've done, Lancelot, you great fool. Ah, now go ahead and fight. Oh. Uh, Signorina, 
You will kindly tell me your full name. I am the Countess Paula Louise de Saint Seven de Rochefort de la Boussico. Uh, thank you. Then I will begin. Whereas it has come to the knowledge of Giuseppe Mario Puccelli, Justice of the Peace of this Township, and Francesco de Bono, Medical Officer of Health of the same Township, that Signorina Camilla Mizzi... Camilla? Who's oh, she? Has been, ...has been admitted to hospital suffering from an infectious disease. It has pleased the aforesaid Mario Puccelli... Oh, this is a ...and I Francesco de Bono to declare that all the grounds, building, appurtenances, and menages, together with the persons of... Uh, uh, Lancelot uh, Masterman, Victoria Drake, uh, William Drake, Myrna Van Stutten, Wilfred Pitts Bean, and the Countess uh, Paula Louise de saint Savin de Rochefort de la Boussico be placed in a quarantine. Oh. <laughs> Until the exact nature and extent of the disease has been determined. A quarantine? What absolute nonsense. Oh, Lord, we'll be without a skivvy. Oh, Carmela, how awful. I don't believe oh, it. Oh, such a noise. Will someone tell me what this is all about? Silence. Silence! Oh, that's better. Uh, now, Major, what's your name? Uh, Salvatore. Now, Major Salvatore. Oh, something cooking. Excuse me. Sir. Just answer me one question. Who started all this? Was it the medical officer and the justice of the peace? Or was it you? It was not me. I am the servant of the law. And I expect you to observe the order which I have just read to you. And I must inform you that this house is under heavy police guard. I warn you, Salvatore, if you go through with this... I shall not rest until I've brought your stupid and petty-minded jack-in-office conduct to book. I intend to see the people who signed that confounded paper. Granted. And provided you meet them in the open air, at a distance of five paces. I regret, but you are all confined strictly to this house and grounds until the, the nature of your maid's illness is determined. However, provisions will be sent here daily. You have only to order, and I will arrange. Oh, and there is one little thing more. Something else? I, too, must remain in a quarantine. What? what? Here? I regret. It is the law. And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltech's theater play, The Policeman and the Lady. Motorists agree that Caltech's butane boosted gasolines take better care of your car's performance. You get faster starts, smoother acceleration, more economical running. Change to Caltech's butane boosted gasoline and feel the difference. The Caltech Theatre now presents Mary Disney and Keith Eden in The Policeman and the Lady, Act Two. <laughs> Too good for me again. Still, I gave you a good run for your money. Uh, my dear Admiral, I had all of the luck. Oh, nonsense. I know what I'm talking about. Oh, darn it, I was fencing champion of the Navy for five years. You know, Vicky, the boy's brilliant. He must be. And now he tells me he played in the Olympic Games. Why, well, say, really? We are discovering many things about you, Eduardo. Well, nice ones, I hope, madame. Oh. Uh, men like you, with your education and abilities, what are you doing in this wretched little place? Uh, I shall have to treat the Minister of the Interior to another lunch and see what can be done about it. Well, that would be very kind, but I find I am perfectly content to be what I am. Well, where's your ambition, man? I do not think I have any, no? Huh? Oh, well, must be the climate out here. Come to think of it, I'm not feeling too anxious to get back into harness myself. Anything by helicopter, Bill? No, nothing important, sir. Good. Lancelot, you are very hot. Now go straight up and take a shower. You know how easily you get a chill? Don't nag, woman. I was just going. So I should think. Oh, it is time for me to go and dress for my party. Vicky, are you coming? In a minute, Bummy. Well, I will go and put away the foils. Eduardo, you hinted at a surprise for tonight. Uh, these singers are from the village, Victoria. They are going to serenade us after dinner in the garden in honor of the Comtesse's birthday. 
Oh, how romantic that sounds. Ah, wait until you hear our music, Signora. It is a very beautiful. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, Bill, we'd better empty ashtrays and things. Oh, yes, all right. I say it's odd, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, here we are, confined to barracks for days on end, and not knowing if we'll ever be allowed out again. And what do we care? <laughs> not a jot all. I wonder why. Even the domestic arrangements are running smoothly, mostly thanks to Myrna. Yes, but I mean, everyone's blossomed out. Well, except old Pitts Bing, of course. Heavens, where is Bingo? Sulking on the terrace, as usual, hoping to waylay Myrna. He's fearfully jealous of Eduardo. And that's another thing, Eduardo. Now, three days ago, he was the worst case of inferiority, what did I ever knew? Ready to spit in your eye for a penny. And now... Love's a wonderful thing. Yes, it's not only that. Now, take your mother. You take her, darling. Yes, it looks as if I shall have to. She's obviously settling in. I'll lay you six to four, she snaffles the old man. Would you mind very much? Well, I think she's rather an old sweetie five. Oh, don't let her hear you calling her old if you want peace in the home. Bill, what about you? Do you feel different? Come here, and I'll show you. I beg your pardon. <laughs> uh, uh, come oh. in, sir. That's all right. We're, we're just going to dress anyway. Oh, we'll have to hurry. Excuse us, Bingo. Well, help yourself to a drink, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh, don't be late, Eduardo. There's a special souffle. I will not be late. Eduardo, whippersnapper. Oh, uh, Salvatore, uh, I should like a word with you, if you please. Oh, do you wish to speak to me, Captain Pitsping? I most certainly do. It concerns Miss Van Stooten. Well, this does not surprise me. Well, senor? Allow me to inform you that it is my intention to make Miss Van Stooten my wife. Is Miss Van Stooten aware of your intentions? She is. I had known her a considerable time before you even met her. To put it into words that you will readily understand, I saw her first. <laughs> well, I would not dream of paying my addresses to the lady if she showed me that they were not welcome. Oh, man is a good-hearted soul. She doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Why? Well, do I have to say why? Think for yourself, man. She's a beautiful young American lady, cultured and well off. Oh, she's rich, is that so? Oh, oh, no, 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 richer than most Americans, of course. I meant, uh, well, you know, uh, well off. And you do not think uh, for her marriage with a married dozen policeman is uh, quite the thing, eh? Admirably put. That's it precisely. Th there's nothing personal about it. I it's simply that, well, mixed marriages are a mistake. Mixed? You'd better be careful, Captain Pittsbeing. Oh, come now, why don't you face facts? Why do you talk to me in this way? Why are you so contemptuous? My dear fellow, I'm not contemptuous. It's simply that I find great difficulty in conversing with someone with whom I have absolutely nothing in common. I wonder what the late lamented Captain Edward Wilfred Anstruther Pitts being would have said to that. Eh? Well, what the deuce would my father have to do with this? Everything. He happens to be my father as well. <coughs> what? Which can be proved. <laughs> It's a lie. It's the truth. I'm very much afraid that you are my brother. This is terrible. Unfortunately, yes. It was a great shock to me, too. <laughs> but I have decided that I must make the best of you. And I advise you to do the same, Brother Wilfred. Oh, this is the end. Oh, you will get used to it in time. The feeling of shame will wear off. Mine has. <laughs> Why, I can even look at you without feeling nauseated. You... you... What's going on in here? Oh, Miss Van Stooten. Myrna. Hadn't you better start dressing for dinner, Eduardo? I have a souffle waiting for the starting gun. Uh, yes, I will go at once. <laughs> Eduardo must be losing his grip. He did what he was told instead of back answering. Now, may I ask what this latest quarrel was about? Oh, it was uh, nothing. He's inclined to be hysterical, like all people of his... Uh, like some people. What was he being hysterical about? You. Well, I thought that was it. Mena, I don't want you to be angry with me, but I presumed upon our friendship to warn young Eduardo not to make too much of the interest you take in him because of your uh, natural kind-heartedness. I hope I interpreted your wishes correctly. There's one thing I do admire in a man, and that is a slice of real, honest-to-goodness courage. Ah. On the other hand, I do not admire what we in America call nerve. I don't quite follow. You will. If it were not that I am convinced that you have the sort of courage that goes with a bonehead, Captain. Oh, I say. I should be seriously annoyed with you. As it is, we'll just forget all about it, shall we? Except that we will remember not to do it again. Oh, that's very generous of you, Manor. But believe me, I acted from the very best possible motives. I was afraid that was so. My, my only excuse, my, my only excuse is that I, I love you, Manor. 
Please get up. Oh, someone may come in. I love you with a deep and enduring passion which blinds me to everything else but the radiance of your beauty. Oh, I say, this is good. I've never had a proposal like this before. Where was I? I mean, uh, uh, Myrna, is there a chance? If there isn't, please put me out of my suspense. Believe me, it would be kinder. Look, uh, aren't you proposing to the wrong woman? Eh? Less than a week ago, you arrived here from France with another bundle of charms. Uh, you mean the Countess, of course. I do mean the Countess. You can't be serious. But I am. <laughs> oh, really, Maria? You thought... <laughs> oh, no, you couldn't have. <laughs> How priceless. <laughs> what made you change your mind, Captain Wilfred? Did she ask you to lend her some money, too? I think that wasn't meant kindly. Please, Mother, I was asking you to marry me, you know. Now it's my turn to ask you something. When did you discover I'm worth cultivating? You mean the Van Student fortune? I mean just that. Uh, that? Come on, who told you? Uh, I forget who it was. It couldn't have been a press photographer by any chance? Oh, no, no, uh, no, no. Uh, the, the, the chap at the club, uh, some time ago, as a matter of fact. Oh, Myrna, I assure you, you misjudge me utterly. Then get up from your knees and we'll say no more about it. I don't wish anyone else to know who I am. You can rely on me to respect your wishes. Oh, that's fine. And you will conceal your aching heart from the populace? I will do my best to look cheerful, though it will be difficult enough in all conscience. Oh. <laughs> Poor Bingo. Oh, wonderful smells coming from the galley. By Jove, Myrna, if I wasn't otherwise busy, I'd have married you for your cooking alone. Now that is something like a proposal. Well, I must prepare my food plate. Yeah, yeah, cocktails. Oh. What the deuce is wrong with you, Pitsbing? Uh, sir, Admiral, isn't it time this situation was ended? Huh? This quarantine. Are you quite satisfied the whole thing wasn't contrived by Major Salvatore? For what purpose? Miss Van Stuten. You know who she is, do you? Of course. So I imagined as Salvatore. Yeah. Well, I don't think he could have managed it, but if he did, it shows he's a man of considerable initiative, wouldn't you say? Or completely unscrupulous. Usually the same thing. Uh, uh, have a drink. Uh, no, thank you. If you'll forgive my saying so, sir, you appear to be taking this enforced leisure in quite a different manner from what I would have expected in a man of your reputation. Well, I'm sorry if you disapprove, but this enforced leisure happens to be my first in 30 years. And what's more, it's given me a chance to renew an old, uh, an old friendship. In fact, Pitts Bing, I've decided to retire when we get out of here and enjoy life while there's yet time. Retire? If you had any sense, you'd do the same. It takes capital to retire, sir. Ah, Louise, you look wonderful. Oh, thank you, Lancelot. By Jove. Doesn't look a day over 35, eh, hey, Pitts Bing? Oh, you shouldn't have said that to him, Lancelot. Countess, permit me to wish you many happy returns of your birthday. And you shouldn't have said that to me, to remind a lady of her birthdays is not always kind. I beg your pardon, madam. I accept your apology. Lancelot, just now I heard Eduardo singing under the shower. Oh, he sings like an angel. Eduardo? What did you say, Bingo? <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Bingo. I am afraid tonight is not, how do you say, his night. <laughs> I saw you come in from the garden. You do not like our music? Oh, yes. And my singing? You liked that? Your singing was okay. <laughs> oh, why do you laugh? <laughs> I have just the song as I will never sing again. Then I say to the lady to whom I've sung, you liked it? And she replies, okay. That is not how the poets would have said it. <laughs> You're a strange man, Eduardo. Every day more of you emerges. Before dinner, it was fencing. Now it's music. Have you any other politics? I kiss very prettily. Oh, I suppose I asked for that. I have annoyed you. Who did you think I was? One of your peasant girls in the vineyard? Well, there's no need to be angry because you are kissed. If you had not done so, you would have wondered what was the matter with your appearance. 
Is it not so? <laughs> oh, all right. You startled me for a moment. It's a long time since any man tried to do that. You surprise me. You cook divinely. Ah, that souffle. Ah, such a beautiful figure and such a lovely face. You say the nicest things in the oddest order. Oh, but I can say nicer things. Well, go ahead. Don't mind me. No, not now. Later. Why later? There is something that must be done before I continue. You mean I'm low priority? Uh, no, I think that you're fishing. Oh, that was an outrageous thing to say. It was not kind to speak of peasants' girls in vineyards. Oh, I know I should have said that. Oh, they're all coming in. Oh, it was divine. I cried a little. Victoria, is my face all right? Perfectly. Eduardo, you sing like an angel. Oh, that's a very kind, the Comtesse. Very nice, my boy. Absolutely bang on. What did you think of it, Bingo? A little sweet for me. One misses the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone thirsty? There's plenty on the ice. Oh, good idea, my boy. I'll get it. Now, sit where you are. I'll ring for service. Ring? Well, don't be a chump, Bill. What's the good of doing that? Uh -huh. Oh, what is this? Another surprise? Wait and see. You ring, Signore? Tony! What are you doing here, Tony? But I am helping Caramella, Signore. Carmella? There are many dishes to be washed up. Caramella? What? You mean she's better? She, she's back? Yes, back in the kitchen. Uh, one moment, I will go and see. Tony! Well, did you come under Camilla? Well, I do not understand what is happening. Bill, how long have you known about this? Well, a policeman brought a letter just before dinner. <laughs> Camilla's all right. She'd eaten too many ripe strawberries. What? Too many ripe... <laughs> May I ask why you didn't tell us at once? <laughs> and spoil everybody's dinner? Oh, Merle had gone to so much trouble with that souffle. Oh, Bill, you're a dear. Besides, Eduardo had arranged the concert. Eduardo? Don't you think it's curious that he, sh he should not have been informed by the authorities? Oh, the policeman brought a letter for him, too. I sat on it as well. Oh, very wise of you, my boy. Do I understand we're all free to go? Yes, we certainly are. <laughs> well, I'll have to return to my ship. I'll get my things, Vicky. Oh, I think I have a migraine coming on. No, Louise. You have no time for migraines. Up you go and pack. You're coming with me, aren't you? But of course, Lancelot. Uh... I have the time for a migraine also. I have already packed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is important work to be done by some of us. Good evening. Good evening, Captain Pitsbing. Oh, good evening. Oh, oh Manor, I feel quite weepy. About the parents getting together? Yes. I've dreamed of this all my life. They're ideally suited. You see that, don't you? Daddy is pompous and bad-tempered and overbearing, and Mummy is vain, frivolous, and greedy. But it, it's a perfect match. You was my hanky. Thanks. I wonder why the Major hasn't come back. I was just wondering, too. Victoria, has anyone told you I'm the richest woman in the world? Daddy did last night. And what did you think of it? Well, that your wealth hasn't brought you the happiness it should. I'll say it hasn't. You don't have any decent friends. So you get along with a few other poor little rich folk who keep introducing their brothers and their cousins. And you know all the time that it's your money they want to marry. If I felt like that, I'd give it all away. <laughs> you wouldn't. You'd say you would, but you wouldn't just the same. Vicky, come on, help me get ready. Oh. You go. Yes, I'd better. Oh, here's Eduardo. Oh. You know, of course, about Carmela. Yes. Yes, we heard. Well, I'll see you later. You were... Uh... A long time away. Ah, but they had to find something. What? This. A ring? It is for you. Oh, quite a nice ring, too. Well, it ought to be. I paid 25 shillings for it. <laughs> oh. Oh. Try it on. If it does not fit, we will have it altered after we are married. Is this a proposal? But of course. In Minnetosa, we married the girl that we have kissed. What a novel idea. <laughs> And now that you are wearing my ring, we are as good as married. Is that another old Melitosan custom? Yes, it is. Well, I don't think it's very gallant trapping a poor girl into matrimony by dazzling her with all this wealth. The rest of the proposal is as follows. Uh, but first, you must seat yourself. It is the custom in Melitosan. Uh, like this? And uh, a little wooden. Uh, please relax and give a little smile. Well, I thought this was a proposal, not a photographer's session. Uh, you should be holding a bouquet of flowers, which are taking much of your attention. Uh, how's this? Splendid. Hold it. 
Now, now I, I come in. I remove my hat and bow. I kneel. So, then I describe your charms in detail. Go right ahead, in English. Myrna, you are the loveliest of women. You are tall and graceful. Your eyes shine with ardent love. Your hair nestles in the nape of your neck and frames the pale oval of your face. Your mouth... Go on. Your mouth, your... Oh, Myrna. Oh, Edward, oh, my sweet... Mm. Uh, you will... He will really marry the village policeman? Oh, of course. Oh, Edward, why did you take so long? Well, I had no ring. In Meritosa, there must be a ring. Oh, when I think how near I was to missing you for lack of a ring, I feel shaky in the knee joints. Oh, my darling. Oh, this is wonderful. The past is dead. You and I will be happy. I know it. I feel it here. You are more charming than I knew. You are growing in beauty before my eyes. Now, that is a perfect speech. Uh, I can say things like that forever, but they sound better in Melitosan. And better still when you sing them. Oh, Eduardo, this was worth waiting for. Ooh, is it possible that I can arouse such feelings? I'm a better man than I thought I was. <laughs> Eduardo, tell me, if you could be granted five wishes, what would you choose? Oh, that's not that difficult. Uh... Uh, I wish to be married as soon as possible. That's one. Uh, in the church across the valley. Two. I want four sons and three daughters. Oh, have a heart. Three. And uh, I want to be prime minister of a militosa. Four. Mm. Can I think of anything else I want? <laughs> there must be something else. Oh, wait, I have it. I would like to see Wilfred Pitts being his face when he hears that I have captured the richest girl in the world from under his very nose. <laughs> what? <laughs> it will be a hard pill for him to swallow, but I should not be uncharitable. <laughs> what is the matter, Carmine? You knew who I was all the time. Not all the time, no. When did you know? When did you know? Well, as soon as you told me your name. It is a part of my duties to guard the persons of important visitors to Meditosa. What of it? What of it? You stand there and say, what of it? Uh, yes, what of it, my darling? Don't you dare call me that. Don't come near me. Was that why you arranged for us all to be locked up here? I do not understand. Oh, yes, you do. Men will do anything for money. I believe I see what you mean, Karamir. And it would have been an excellent idea and well worth trying. Oh! But I had not the power to do such a thing. I don't believe you. Here, take back your shoddy ring. No, no, no. We shall buy a better one when we are married. But keep it till then. It is the custom in Meritosa. Take it and get out of my way. Get out! Keep quiet and sit down. Myrna! Oh! That's a better. Now, I have something to say to you. All my life, because of my parentage, I've been filled with hatred and envy and all things uncharitable. Until I met the girl who talked to me in her funny vernacular and told me to snap out of it. So I fell in love with the girl. And then I found to my delight that she was rich. That made me love her even more. You stand there and admit it? But of course. I wish to marry you because you are a beautiful woman. And then I find that because you also have a lot of money, there is no reason at all why I, a poor man, cannot marry you. How do you figure that out? Well, because now there will be enough for us and our seven children. Oh, you're utterly shameless. Are you prepared to live on my money for the rest of your life? But of course. It would look foolish for you to have a husband who is a policeman when you could have married an English duke. Now, look here. I'm not going to marry you. But of course you are. We love each other. You're nothing but a common fortune hunter. What is that wrong? To seek one's fortune? Money can buy things. We can live in the comfort and give all that is necessary to our seven children. Oh, if it's you a... mention those seven children again, I shall scream. Ah, you are overwrought. It is unnatural. I have seen a young woman throw a whole basket of lobsters at her man for the sheer joy of love. She had all the luck. Now, see here, it's no good trying to blarney me. A murder. My name is Miss Van Stooten. Uh, for a little longer, then you'll be the senior uh, servitore. Oh, for a basket of lobsters! Here, take this vase. What? Uh, break it on my head. Well, you asked for it. 
I hate you, I hate you. Good, good, more vases. Oh, I hate this. Come and put it, honey, come. Take that. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, my precious lamb, ah, uh, my beloved. You know it is always so when a woman casts out the devils that have battened upon her for so long. They are fighting hard, but they will go. Here is a dry handkerchief. Oh. Mm. You are even more beautiful in tears than when you smile. Oh. What's happening? Oh, my room! Mana! You beast, Eduardo, what have you done to her? Oh. There is a saying in Manitosa, Signora, that only fools and lawyers interfere in lovers' quarrels. Mana, are you all right? Oh, Victoria, I'm so happy. I, I don't understand. Oh, that man is a common fortune hunter. He knew I was rich and he opened the glories in it. He's going to be Prime Minister of Melitosa. He will spend all my money. He's told me to my face that he's glad I'm rich so that he need never work again. He is a thorough cad, but I'm going to marry him and have seven children. What? Yes, uh, four boys and three girls. Oh, Victoria, look at him strut. I shall buy this casa. It is full of happy memories. My mother worked here, and was here she met my father. It will be nice to bring up my children in this casa. And, of course, we shall travel. My wife will want to visit her friends in America. There will be delegations to the United Nations. And I've always wanted to see London Zoo. But always we will return to this casa where it all began. Is it not so, my sweet? Oh, isn't he wonderful? I think you're both potty. No, she does not understand. Bill has never thrown anything at me. Someday perhaps he will, dear. My dear man. Oh, good heavens, it's bingo. My dear Eduardo. What? May I be the first to congratulate you both? Say, how do you know? You raised your voice a little. I think everybody in town knows by now. Wonderful news travels fast. And when is the great day? Do my ears deceive me, or is Wilfred pleased about something? He is happy that I am marrying a rich woman, that is all. Why should he be happy? Well, doubtless he has discovered that in Manitoba it is the custom for all members of the same family to share in each other's good fortune. I still don't see. He is my blood brother. Well, if that doesn't beat the band. Today, Myrna, I have lost a bride and found a brother. You've found more than one, Wilfred. I say there's a... Oh, it was a mess. I say there's a big crowd of villagers in the garden, all grinning like mad. Now, what's going on round here? Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 ah, it is my family come to greet my bride. Your what? Did I not tell you, my sweet? Your Eduardo is the eldest of a 25. Oh! T 25? Uh, doubtless my aunts, uncles and cousins also have come to pay their respects. Oh, oh, oh. Pitts Bing's passed out. Move over, Wilfred. Here I come. Oh. Uh, Karamir, uh, beloved. Uh, her joy has been uh, too much for her. Ah, uh, love is indeed a wonderful thing. So ends our Caltex play, The Policeman and the Lady. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltex Theatre. The Policeman and the Lady was written by Gilbert and Margaret Hochforth Jones and adapted for radio by Kay Keaveney. In the starring roles you heard as Myrna Van Stutten, Mary Disney, and in the role of Major Salvatore, Keith Eden. The supporting cast was as follows. Captain Pitts Bing, Paul Bacon. Admiral Masterman, John Morgan. Comtesse de Saint-Savin, Moira Carlton. Victoria Drake, June Salter. Bill Drake, Harry Starling. Tony, Norma Edwards. <laughs> Next week in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear an adaptation of the outstanding Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer motion picture, Young Bess. 
a new play telling of the early life of Queen Elizabeth I, the little-known story of the difficulties that beset the path of a young princess in an age when to be out of royal favour was to walk with death. Be listening for this fine drama, Young Bess, next week. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night on behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltex Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world-famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil and Marfac Lubrication. Welcome to the Caltech Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltech Theatre is brought to you by Caltech Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltech dealers and distributors everywhere. Tonight in the Caltex Theatre you will hear The Queen Came By, a moving drama of life among the staff of a large department store at the time of Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Starring tonight, you will hear Neva Carglin, your producer, Cresic Jenkinson. <laughs> The Queen Came By, Act One. Guards, they're all in uniform. I simply must have a peep. Dinner or no dinner. My goodness, look at that one with the staff. Why ever doesn't he drop it? Oh, finish your dinner, Kitty. You'll be called out any minute. A hundred and three, not counting the goat. Goat? The mascot, Emmy. Oh. But that's nothing to what they'll have Jubilee Day. I've got it all planned where I'm standing, but it'll mean starting out from here at four in the morning Let's make it a party, shall we? Well, we will see, Maud. Forward, Maud. Oh, you're required at your counter in the great store beyond. Through the door and serve, my girl. Serve. Oh, all right, Esther. Thanks. <sighs> Thanks, she says. <laughs> Thanks for being to told to go inside and serve again. Oh, my feet. Oh, my poor feet. Oh, whoever invented department stores anyway? Whoever did had no consideration for the feet of the saleswomen. Oh, that's a certainty. Have something to eat, Esther, and you'll feel much better. Uh, what is it? Oh, no. Oh, not that hodgepodge again. It tastes much better than it looks, Esther. Oh, it'd need to. Oh, what was the band about? Soldiers practicing for the Jubilee. Oh, that. Huh. You know, you'd think they'd cut those procession things out now. After all, this is 1897. All that royal pomp and nonsense seems a bit middle ages to me. Esther, you shouldn't speak about the Queen like that. <laughs> what I says is not going to hurt our Victoria, dear. Oh, this mess they call food is ghastly. Esther, Maud wants us to get up a party on the day and start out first thing for a curbside view. Well, she can count me out. I'm going on the river. With Mr Goldfish? <laughs> His name isn't really Goldfish, dear. He just looks like one. He does that. I don't know how you could, Esther. Fancy being middle-aged, German, and a commercial traveller. It wouldn't surprise me if he wasn't married into the bargain. Oh, shut up, Kitty. Oh, I'm sorry, Esther. I was only joking. It wasn't a very good joke, I'm afraid. It was not. Well, I am sorry. I want to be gay today. Heaven knows I should be. It's my birthday. 
And I'd like to say... Why are the three of you in here at once? Oh, <laughs> we're second sitting, Mrs. Peel, and people like you keep on interrupting us so we can't finish our meal. This is supposed to be a half day, and half day begins at two, not half past one. Hurry and finish, all of you. The maid wants to wash up. And I mean hurry. <sighs> When I see Mrs. Peel, I always feel sorry for Mr. Peel. Forward, Miss Muirhead. Oh, oh, what again? Oh, it's true what they say. No peace for the wicked. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Higgins. Oh, my fault, Miss Muirhead. Miss Lee, Miss Tape. Mr. Higgins. Morning, Mr. Higgins. Lovely day. Yes. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, indeed. Anything we can do for you, Mr. Higgins? Oh, I was just wondering if I could get this piece of material matched. Oh, well, there are all the belts. Oh, yes. I'll match it for you, Mr. Higgins. Oh, it's no trouble, thank you. Oh, but I'd like to. I'd like to do anything today. Because I'm on top of the world, you see. It's my birthday. Yes, I know. I saw the birthday cake. Birthday cake? For me? Oh, I said the wrong thing. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <sighs> No, Sale. I might have known. Really, I'm terribly sorry mentioning the cake. I, I didn't realise it was a surprise. Oh, that's all right. I, I suppose it would have been a miracle if the secret had been kept. Emmy, did you make it for me? Mm? Oh, but of course you did. Oh, you're a darling as usual. <laughs> oh, let me see it, Emmy. No, no, not till tonight when we go home. Oh. Are we going to have a party? Well, that depends on how long Mrs. Peel stays out of the way. Forward, Miss Tape. Oh, you're all so sweet to me. And I love you all. You, Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> you, Esther. Oh, get on with your kit. <laughs> and you, Mr. Higgins. Run along, Kitty. I said one moment. Is that the sort of behaviour you reserve for business premises in shop hours? Well, she was only romping, Mrs. Peel. It's not the sort of romping Sir Oswald Carter Brook would encourage on his premises, with customers waiting in his shop. And what are you doing here, Mr. Higgins? I came in to match this material, Mrs. Peel. Very well, match it, and return to your counter at once. I've done so, thank you. Forward by Billening. Miss Tape, Mr. Frisbee is calling you. Yes, I'm going, Mrs. Peel. And as for what she was doing in here when I came in... Would you mind moving out of the way? I'd like to see in the mirror. Fix my hair. Thank you. How long do you intend to remain here vulgarising yourself, Miss Muirhead? I'm taking my 15 minutes dressing time. You've already exceeded it. You've been in here the best part of 20 minutes. <sighs> well, that isn't much after five hours on me feet, is it? The manager shall be the judge of that. As you are senior hand here, Miss Lee, I shall want your support if I report Miss Muirhead to Mr. Frisbee. I'm sorry, Mrs. Peel. I... I couldn't give it to you. If I'm to be responsible for discipline here... Discipline in off hours, Mrs. Peel. The rest is Mr. Frisbee's concern. I sometimes think you forget I have personal access to Sir Oswald, Miss Free. You never give us a chance to forget that. I really must speak to Sir Oswald about all you women one day. Oh, silly old fool. Oh, I still haven't matched it, Miss Lee. The mm? shade's wrong when you get it in the light. Oh, well, we'll try the ginger brown on the second shelf. Mm. Oh, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, will Kitty get into trouble? I don't think so. Oh, that's good. I hope I haven't spoiled anything telling Kitty about the cake. Oh, I just wanted it to be a little surprise for her. You see, she's never had a birthday cake before. Well, nobody cares about your birthday when you live in an orphanage. Mm. You love Kitty very much, don't you? Yes, Mr. Higgins, I do. But then, so does everyone else here. Except Mr. Frisbee and Mrs. Peel. Oh, but, but your feeling's different. It's like the way a mother feels for an only child. What if it is? She's got no one else, has she? I wasn't criticising. I think it's rather beautiful. Like a splash of colour among a lot of drabness. Oh, that is nice to hear. You're in love with Kitty yourself, aren't you? No, uh, I don't think she's interested in me. Oh, I wouldn't say that. She's got as far as planning the house she wants and... Um, that young chap, Albert Betterbees, has left the district, hasn't he? I think so. Then you have a clear field. Now, next time you're out with her, 
don't spend all the time talking about politics. But I'm interested in politics. Do you think she is, though, after 12 hours a day at the counter? But it's that negative attitude that makes these conditions possible. Think of all this trumpet braying about the Jubilee. We can't just sit down under it. Forward, Mr. Riggins. Oh, dear, that's your counter. But you're on our side, really. You must be. You read a lot. The right sort of stuff. If only you... Oh, do stop talking nonsense, Mr. Higgins. No, have you heard about the Fabians? We clean one out of those little Shantung suits, Emmy. They only came in the day before yesterday. Oh, am I interrupting anything? Uh, no, dear. Uh, the repeat order on their suits arrived this morning. Now I know exactly where to lay hands on them. Uh, you wait here, Kitty. Oh, you needn't bother, Emmy. Just, just tell me where they are. No, you'd never find them. I won't be long. Oh, well, all right. Thanks. Got your material yet, Mr. Higgins? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I've got it. Look, Kitty, I, I never get the chance to say any of the things I want to say to you. I think you're the... Oh, Kitty, let's go to the Crystal Palace. I was down there last Thursday, and it's grand. But you love the life-size models of all the prehistoric monsters in the gardens. It sounds very nice, but... Paul with the Manchester Colonel. But that's you, Mr. Higgins. But you will come, Kitty, won't you? I can't, Mr. Higgins. I'm sorry. But... I'm sorry. I I'm spoken for. Oh, I see. So Albert Betterby's back again, is he? Yes, he's been away on business. Ah. Kitty, it isn't just because I'm fond of you myself, but... Albert Betterby isn't your sort, and... You think he's common, don't you? Just because he doesn't speak like the people here. No, it isn't that. Who are we to talk class nonsense, anyhow? It's, it's something quite different. He may be all right, but he's no good for you. There's a suit in this box, Kitty. Now ask Emmy now. Go on. Ask her about Albert Betterby. Hmm? I don't see what Albert's got to do with you or Emmy, Mr. Higgins. But you hardly know the man. You're quite wrong about that. I know everything I want to know about him. He's very gay and kind and funny and... And what I think about him has nothing to do with you. Kitty? you better go inside now, Roger. Mr. Frisbee's been calling. Yes, Mr. Frisbee has been calling. Oh, no. dear. It might interest you to know that there are two customers at the heavy counter, Mr. Higgins. Yes, Mr. Frisbee. Well, get going, get going. Yes, yes, I'm going now. And when you finish the heavy counter, there are one or two other things I want you to do. Oh, oh. Emmy. Hmm? Emmy, what is it, dear? What's the matter? Are you in pain? Oh, no, 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 Esther. It's, it's nothing. It's... Oh, just a, a touch of indigestion, I, I think. Are you sure? Oh, you look all well, sort of... Well, of course I'm sure. <laughs> oh, heavens, what a serious face and over nothing. Come on now, let's get things tidied up in here. It'll be closing time before long and we want to have the place looking clean and tidy by then, don't we? <laughs> Hello, hello. And there's my Emmy today. Help it better be. You're back. I thought you'd gone away for good. It doesn't look like it, does it? Hey, what's going on here this afternoon, anyway? I noticed quite a few of the staff still here. Mr. Frisbee made an announcement just after closing time. Seems that the Queen will be coming by here in the Jubilee procession. So the owner, that's Sir Oswald Carter Brook. Is that why I wouldn't know? Well, he asked through Mr. Frisbee for volunteers to stay back today and decorate the windows in um, an empire theme. It's a sort of competition among all the branches. The best decoration wins a prize, you see. Oh, yes. And Mr. Higgins and the others are in there now doing their best to win the prize for this branch. Well, good for them. Hey, where's Kitty? She's gone upstairs to change. Oh. Well... I've got the surprise of her life for her when she comes down. You know what I got outside? A coach and six. I shouldn't wonder. A ice sprung trap and the fastest trotter in Le Levi livery stables. And trust her, but he sat behind them all. Huh. You know, it beats me how you people stay on year after year in this flea pit. No future in drape, old girl, none at all. Best thing Kit ever did for herself was to run into me. <laughs> I'll soon have her out of this. I reckon she's told you, eh? Tell me what? About us getting spliced. 
I don't think she takes you as seriously as that. And don't you believe it? She'll jump the minute I say go. Kitty's no fast trotter from Levi's stables, you know. <laughs> you don't like me very much, do you, me? What makes you ask that? Intuition. My intuition's pretty smart. It's got to be in my line. And what is your line? Don't you know? Tea. I work for Gaten's, the Tea Kings, big place on Hayes Wharf. Officially, I'm a tea sampler. And unofficially? Merchant, working my own line of connections. Doing well at it, too. I buy rejected chests of tea at a knockdown price, then I'll sell it at one and two a pound. I see. And why do people buy your reject tea at one and two a pound? Well, they can get Gaten's for the same price. Because I've got a key to the label department. My tea goes out with a Gaten's label on it. Oh. Smart, eh? Not very. Huh? But thank you for telling me about it. It's what I've been waiting to hear. Now, do you recognise this? Yeah, of course I do. It's one of my pound packs. That's right. Now, you either stop going out with Kitty after today, or this pound of tea will find its way to your employers with a letter, asking them to examine the contents. Hey, what do you mean, worming all my business secrets out of me? I knew all about your business, all but the details. But Kitty thinks she's in love with you, and I can't afford to make a mistake. Do you think I'd stand by and see Kitty get mixed up with a cheap little cut purse like you? Right, well, what's it to be, Albert? Kitty or the police? You'd never dare tell Gaitens. I'd dare a lot more than that for Kitty. Why, you blackmailing old... Why, hey, Albert! Uh, oh, uh, hello, Kit. What are you doing here? You said you wouldn't be calling for me. Oh, I changed my mind. Oh, I'm glad about that. A gentleman should call for his lady friend. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm ready to go if you are. Oh, all right. Emmy? Mm -hmm. uh, Amy, it's not right for you having no half day. Oh, Mr Higgins is keeping me company, dear. Now, don't be late back to supper, will you? Not tonight, I won't. Good. Give her a nice time, Albert. Yeah. I'll give her a nice time, all right. Now, come on, kid. Bye, Amy. Bye-bye, dear. <laughs> Emmy, mm. look, I, I borrowed these gloves from Maud's locker. Uh, they look all right with this dress. Yes, very nice, Esther. But will Maud mind about you borrowing them? <laughs> oh, too bad if she does. <laughs> no, we got an arrangement about borrowing. Oh, well, off to the goldfish, I suppose. Oh, Miss Muirhead, I'm glad you haven't gone. I was just going, Mr Frisby. I'd like a word with you first. Uh, oh, uh, well, if I'm staying here this afternoon, I'm... Going up for me bedroom slippers. You excuse me, Mr. Frisbee. Of course, Miss Slough. You needn't be diffident about not staying on today, Esther. I only ask for volunteers. That's what I understood. I'm not being diffident, Mr. Frisbee. Why, Mr. Frisbee? All of a sudden. We had all that out last week. Oh. I'm uh, sorry. I lost my temper that day. I regretted it ever since. I'm afraid I haven't, Mr. Frisby. I think I've stood a good deal for the little I've had back from you, Esther. Oh, you always make everything sound nice and commercial, George. I suppose it's force of habit after years of floor pounding. Well, you aren't exactly uh, checking yourself, are you, my dear? Or does the goggle-eyed German think you are? Whatever the goggled-eyed German thinks, George, he doesn't expect to pour me three times a week in exchange for a blind eye and business hours. I, I do get a meal and a music hall out of him now and then. Well, I... B uh, well, I, I told you, Esther, it's too risky to take you out weeknights. If I was single... If you if... were single, we could embrace on Clapham Common instead of in the stock cupboard. What sort of a fool do you think I am, George? Oh, I should never have made a bargain with you in the first place if you're nagging at and driven me nearly out of my mind. Oh, well, at least I'll get something out of it, I suppose. You can't sack me. You can't scale down my money in fines. And you can't even nag me any more. So, let's leave it at that, shall we? I could do a good deal for you, Esther. You'd only treat me right. Treat you right? 
<laughs> oh, you sleazy little grub, George. You can go to hell. Good day. <laughs> the most wonderful news. Oh, well, where is everyone? Oh, I thought there was supposed to be a party here for Kitty tonight. <laughs> Kitty and the others will be here directly, Esther. You're early. Oh, oh well, trust me to time it badly. <laughs> oh, I was going to lay you all on your ears with my little piece of information. Oh, well. Oh, what is it, Esther? What's happened? Maud, my dear, as the French say, regard a. Oh, Wemmy, look. Oh. Esther's got an engagement ring on her third finger oh, leg. Oh, Esther. Oh, Esther, he's asked you. He has. Oh, my dear, congratulations. Oh, thanks, Emmy. Oh, yes, congratulations, Esther. Where did it happen? Oh, you'll never guess. Opposite the duck pond in Battersea Park. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, yes. on his knees. Oh. Absolutely down on his knees. Oh, oh isn't it marvellous? Hey, let's have a look at the ring again. My, a sapphire on diamond trimmings. Of course, it's much too big to be real. This is real, my girl. Make no mistake about that. Yes, Maud. What a dreadful thing to say. Oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, well, you know me. I'm always saying the wrong thing. And you say he got down on his knees, Esther? Mm -hmm, I did. Oh, it was all so romantic. He started kissing my hands and calling me his, uh, his labour snort or something. Oh. <laughs> and how did you know he was proposing? Oh, more. Oh, well, a man don't go down on his knees to ask you the time, now does he? And what did you say? I said... Oh, I said, it, it sounds ever so nice, Mr. Meyer, but couldn't you say it in English? Well, he laughed. He looks ever so much younger when he laughs. And then he took out the ring. He put it on the seat. And he said, if I meant ya, yeah, I was to take it. And if I meant nine, I was to throw it to the ducks. Oh. Well, I mean, it wouldn't have been much good to them, would it? So I took it. Oh, just as well, too, I say. You're not allowed to feed anything to those ducks, you know. <laughs> well, look, I only oh, met. Lord. <laughs> oh, oh well, it's grand that it's happened tonight, <laughs> Esther. Well, now we can have a double celebration. Uh, where's the peas pudding? <laughs> oh, glory be, I'm sitting on oh, it. No. Oh, no. Oh, Esther. Oh, dear. I thought it was your water bottle. Oh, Esther, oh, I was well. so looking forward to that pudding. Oh, dear. Oh, well, you're welcome to all you can scrape off. Oh, Amy, I must be a terrible mess. It'll clean off, dear. Oh, dear. Now, you'll have to make do with the ham, Maud. Oh. Here, uh, take your frock off, Esther. Oh, yes. It'll be all over everything. Oh, dear. All right, then. Here, give me your hand. Right. Yes. Now, now, come on. Mm. Now, don't oh, pull oh, it. Oh, stop! Oh, the, oh, oh. It, it's caught in me stays. Well, Esther, will oh. you keep still? Oh, oh Amy, oh, here. Oh, Take off the stays. Oh, I'm suffocating. Oh, you're not. Now, oh. come on, keep still. Oh, oh. oh goodness. That's Mr. Higgins. Oh, what on earth's he doing here? I asked him to the party. He can't come in. Look at my hair. Oh, just a minute, Mr. Higgins. Here, tie this handkerchief around your head and jump into bed. Oh, well, will somebody get me out of yes, this? Yes, yes, don't panic now. There you are. Oh, oh. Now get into the other room now and get on another frock. Oh, this place gets more and more like a French vase. Are you ready, Maud? Yes, all set. Uh, you can come in now, Mr Higgins. Ah, evening, everyone. I'm a little late, I'm afraid. Uh, better late than never, though, Mr Higgins. Oh, very true, Miss Murch. Is, is there anything wrong with you? I hardly expected to see anyone in bed. Oh, no, I'm fine. Oh, it's just... Uh, um, well, it, it's uh, more convenient. <laughs> Makes more room if I'm out of the way in bed. Oh, I see. Uh, I've brought this, Miss Lee. Oh, that's very kind of you. Oh, Maud. Maud, look, it's another piece pudding and piping hot. Oh. <laughs> we had an accident with the other pudding, Mr Higgins. Esther sat in it. And she got engaged. <laughs> Slightly burnt, too, I imagine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Am I being talked about? Oh. 
Hello there. Welcome to the party. Oh, thanks, Miss Muirhead. Esther, oh, for heaven's sake, look, let's not have any of this formality tonight. It must be Esther, Emmy, Maud and Roger. Yes, right. you're That's right, right, Esther. And uh, what's this about your being engaged, Esther? Did uh, Mr. Meyer pop the question? <laughs> he did. There. What do you think of it? Oh, yes, that's a very nice ring. Congratulations. Thanks, Roger. Oh, what do you got there? Is that a present for me? <laughs> oh, well, no, Esther. Actually, it's a birthday present for Kitty. Ah, oh. Oh, you're a dear boy. And I'm sure she'll love it, whatever it is. Oh, well, now, come on. We'd better do something about the drinks. Where's the fruity Madeira, Duchess? It's there on the table, Esther. Oh, well, then, leave the drinks to me. I'm an expert at filling glasses. What? Here she is. Oh, oh come on in, Kitty. We're all ready for you. We've got it. Oh. Happy birthday, Kitty. Yes, dear. Happy birthday. What's the matter, Kitty? Go away, all of you. Go away. Kitty, what? What's the matter, dear? Don't you touch me. But... Oh, I don't understand. Oh, yes. Please, I I'm sorry, but just leave me alone. Perhaps it might be better if you do as she asks. Would you mind? No, of course not. Uh, well, good night. Hester, uh, Maud, perhaps if you went to your room. Oh, yes. Uh, come on, Maud. Out of Emmy's bed and into your own. But, Kitty, when Maud, are we going? Maud. Yes. Oh, come in, Hester. You'd better get undressed, Kitty. Come on, get into bed. Don't you speak to me. Was it Albert? What did he say? What did he do to you? I said don't speak to me. Oh, come on now, Kitty, be sensible. I'm supposed to be your best friend. Best friend? That, that's a laugh. Kitty. I know I haven't got many brains, but I must have been an absolute idiot ever to take any notice to you. Or to trust you. Oh, I wish I were dead. I wish I were dead. <laughs> And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltech's play, The Queen Came By. Faster starts, smoother acceleration, more economical running. That's what you get from Caltech's butane boosted gasoline. The gasoline designed to take better care of your car's performance. Next time you fill up, change to Caltech's butane boosted gasoline. Your car will respond more readily, tick over more smoothly and steadily. Caltex butane boosted gasolines at the sign of the Caltex Star, where we take better care of your car. You'll be happier by far when you stop at the Caltex Star because of all the things we do. And we take pride in serving you. The Caltex Theatre now presents Neva Carglin in The Queen Came By, Act Two. Oh, Cubby and Roger. I thought you'd like to know. Kitty's come in. Oh. Where, where is she? In the window, packing cotton wool around my snow scene. Well, she won't come up if she knows I'm here. Have you got any sort of plan about her, Emmy? No, no plan. Just a resolution to let her make the first approach. I see. Isn't there a touch of pride about that? Pride? Do you suppose I've got any pride where Kitty's... I'm sorry. I suppose it does look rather like that. And I suppose you're wondering where you come in. Oh, I never stood a chance anyway. Listen, Roger. Albert may have seemed a cheap little fraud to us, but he saw something we didn't see. He saw that Kitty wasn't a child any longer, but a woman. He treated her like one. <sighs> yes. Well, it's Frisbee I'm worried about. If she goes on mooning about the way she is at present, she'll get sacked. Any fool can see that. Well, let's not go looking for that sort of trouble. 
There's your window display coming on. I think it's grand. Everyone does. Oh, that... I only do that to play along with Frisbee. I want to keep in with him till the time's right. Ah, yes, the right time. I'd almost forgotten about the Fabians. How are they, Roger? They're doing all right. That's what I came to see you for, really. It's, it's about these. Mm -hmm. oh, go on, read one. Oh. To Her Majesty the Queen, never mind about the Empire Monkey Parade, ma'am. Fair play for the shop assistant. What does it mean? Is it some sort of war cry? Now, it's our jubilee propaganda. Some of the old fogies were against it, but we carried a motion to distribute these amongst the jubilee crowds on the day. Don't you think that's rather a shame? A shame? Yes. All those people looking forward to something they've read and talked about for months. A bit of colour for once in their lives. Something they're out really to enjoy. And then you come along with a leaflet to remind them that they're due back behind the counter at 8.30 prompt the next morning. But they have to be awakened, Emmy. I don't think this is the way to get better conditions. What other way is there? I think it's better to work on individuals rather than on the masses. Huh? You know, Roger, if enough of you get worked up over a good cause, you're bound to win. But what's so awful is that by the time you've won, you've all got so bad-tempered about it that the cause isn't good anymore. And before you know where you are, somebody's got to start a campaign against you. But we aren't plotting Red Revolution. We leave that to the anarchists. But it isn't what you are, Roger. It's what you become. Some of these people I've heard tub thumping in a park would regulate your food as well as your shop hours. But, Emmy, you've got it all wrong. We don't want to run people's lives. We only aim on taking over the industrial machine. But when a person's tied to the machine for a bread and butter, it amounts to the same thing, doesn't it? Oh, I give up, Emmy. You're kind and sweet and gentle, but you're a perfect reactionary. What's a reactionary? Oh, never mind. I still think you're on our side, or I wouldn't ask you a favor. You don't want me to distribute these leaflets, do you? No, only to mind them for a bit. Mind them? What for? Look, I'm trusting you more than I should. On Jubilee Day, I'm not distributing them. I'm dropping these leaflets from a top story. I'm throwing them down to the street. Good gracious. When? During the procession. The moment the Queen comes by. On the Queen? Well, not on her exactly. They probably nabbed me for treasonable assault. But on the crowd, just after she's passed. But you'll get into dreadful trouble. And you're bound to be sacked. I know that. But I came here for a special job, and this is it. Why drag me into it? Because these leaflets aren't safe in my room. There's no lock on my trunk. And I wouldn't put it past Frisbee to sneak when I'm out. Uh, all right then, Roger. I'll keep them for you. Thanks, Amy. And you know, if, if you only studied our draft charter... Oh. oh, I... Kitty! No, don't go, please. I, I thought Amy was by herself. Look, Kitty, it's the hottest day we've had in weeks. Now, why don't you and me take the tram out to Greenwich? It's pretty down there. I've always wanted to take you. We could go round the observatory and have tea. You look so tired and... Well, you'd enjoy it. I know you would. I'd like to talk to Emmy, if you don't mind. Huh? All right. Whatever you want. Emmy? Yes, Kit. What is it, dear? They've taken Albert to prison. No. Did the policeman take him because of you? You must tell me. Because of me? Of course not. Albert thinks you followed us in the evenings. What? Yes, I've seen him every night since... since that night. Each time there was someone following. But it wasn't me, Kit. I, I didn't even know you were still seeing him. Well, you do believe me, don't you? Yes, I suppose so. Well, you must believe me. I know how annoyed you've been with me. Albert telling you just about everything I said to him. But I'd say it all again to him, Kit. Because I still have your interest very much at heart. Don't you see, dear? He was bound to get caught in the end. He wasn't really clever. He only thought he was. There's a bit in this newspaper about him. That's how I first found out what happened. Show me. Did he really cheat? Do you think like the way it says in the paper? Kitty, his whole life was a cheat. And that's what I was terrified about in case you got mixed up in it. Hmm, 
From the look of this, the police have been watching him for some time. What'd they do to him? Keep him there in prison, of course. For how long? I don't know, dear. It depends. Kitty, when he comes out of prison... It, it doesn't matter when he comes out. What do you mean? When I read this, I went to his lodging. His landlady told me he'd been to prison before. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Kit. And while I was there, another woman came out of Albert's room. She was dreadful. And when she saw me, she, she just stood there and laughed. She'd been living there all the time with him, and she knew all about me. Oh, you poor darling, you... And, and when Albert and me went out together, he was so funny and nice. He just seemed to belong to me. I was never so happy as when we were out together. Well, you just have to put him out of your mind now. Forget about him, Kit. You can't have someone belong to you almost a year and, and then pretend to yourself that he isn't there anymore and won't be ever. It wasn't just like two people walking out together. Me and Albert, we... Oh, Amy, I, I know it was wrong now. And I ought to have told you about it before. I wanted to. But I was afraid you'd be angry. A and it didn't seem wrong at the time. Only when that awful woman came and stood on the stairs and, and laughed at me. That's what made me see it was wicked. Oh, how could I have been such a fool as not to know? Was it wicked, Emmy? Will I get punished? You, you think so, don't you? You think it was wicked? You're not wicked. It's me that was wicked. It's my own fault, all of it. Go on treating you like a child. Then you aren't angry with me? No, no, not with you, Kit. You still don't know anything about these matters, do you? I... Emmy, I, I know enough to realise I'm going to have a baby. Oh. Oh, Emmy, what am I going to do? I, I'll die, Emmy. There, there. I, I'm going to die. God's punishment. No, 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 nonsense. Listen to me. Listen, Kitty, listen. You aren't going to die. Do you suppose that somebody dies every time a baby's born? There's no need to be frightened, dear. I'm here to look after you. Now, you're not to tell anyone about this. Not even Esther. Do you understand, Kitty? Yes. Now, listen, dear. Listen to everything. I know a doctor. He'll tell me how to look after you till the baby comes. I talked to him in the cutting room when he came with his wife the other day. I'll take you to him now. I'll get his address from the book. I know where Mr. Frisbee keeps the keys. I'll go now, Kitty. I won't be a minute, dear. I'll just sit there and, and rest, Kitty. I, I, I must get out of here. Go away. I can't burden myself on Emmy. I must go away. <laughs> still for dinner? Oh, the first party hasn't finished yet, Mrs. Peel. We've been terribly busy. <laughs> Nobody considers me. Cook's determined to watch the procession when it comes. That'll mean we can't clean for tea till gone 3.30. Well, we can't help it. With all these people outside waiting for the Queen to come by, there's scores of customers coming in and out. I'll give the first party another ten minutes and after that they can go hungry. <sighs> oh, if it isn't like Frisbee to open on a day like this. I suppose this muck is Carter Brooks' idea of a jubilee banquet. Ugh. The food's all right if you don't think about it too much. Esther? Mm hmm? You know, sometimes I think Kitty's dead. Oh, rubbish. She's found another billet somewhere. Emmy's been to the police. Only yesterday. Did you see the letter she had this morning? Only a glimpse. It wasn't a proper letter. It was sort of a, a printed form. She just glanced at it, asked me to cover up for her, and went off without even waiting for breakfast. Still, I, I suppose she knows what she's doing. Hmm, I expect so. That Albert better be. He's the one who started all this trouble off. I hope they never let him out of prison. Fancy him passing off that reject tea with Gayton's brand on it. Cool, eh? Ah, oh, idiotic. He should have known he'd never get away with that sort of thing for long. Anyway, 
Now they've found him out, he won't be getting up to any more shady business deals for a long, long time. Forward, baby linen. Oh, that's me again. Why on earth do people want baby linen on Jubilee Day? <laughs> the stalk doesn't stop for processions, do you? <laughs> any more news about Kitty, Esther? Oh, no. No, Emmy's been out searching again. She isn't back yet. Oh, dreadful business. Poor Kitty running off like that. Yes, it is. Yes. Frisbee knows Emmy's out. Oh, does he? I heard him telling a customer the milliner wasn't available. Oh, she'll catch it when she gets back in that case. Maybe. There's a fine crowd down there looking in our windows. <laughs> a great thing you did for us with your dreaded display. Oh, if it keeps us on the go much longer, I'm going to sit in the window and show the customers what the Empire's done to my feet. Well, perhaps I have some news that could brighten you up a little. I heard just a moment ago we got a first in the window competition. We what? Oh, well, for heaven's sake. Well, why are you so calm about it? I was satisfied we had a good chance. It wasn't much of a surprise when the news came through. Oh, well, I think it's wonderful. Oh, the first in all of London. Oh, not oh. exactly that. They decided to split the class into inner and outer London branches. We got first in the suburban class. Oh, trust them. Who won the inner? Oxford Street. Oh, yes. A tonier address would have to win it. <laughs> Still, I suppose it's not bad to be first in the suburbs. We've done a record turnover this morning, too. That's going to make us all millionaires, isn't it? There's something else, too. Sir Oswald Carter Brook is coming down to see us sometime today. I think I might faint with the excitement of that. Shop, Esther. Glove counter. <sighs> roll on, wedding bells. Roll on. Get me out of this as soon as you can. <laughs> Roger. Well, Emmy, you startled me. I wanted to get in here as quietly and unobtrusively as possible. In you go, Kit. Hello. Kitty. Oh, thank God. Here, sit down. What's happened? Where did you find her, Emmy? In the South London Infirmary. We've just come from there. Oh, the poor kid. Now listen, Roger. We haven't got much time. Somehow we've got to persuade Mr. Frisbee and Mrs. Peel to let us stay long enough. Kitty and me so that we can find a new billet. She's too weak to go traipsing around, and I've had about as much worry as I can stand. Well, you don't have to worry any more, Emmy. I've got a better idea. We've won the window competition, and I'm going to ask head office for a position as West End window dresser. What good was They that? get good money. A man can get married on that sort of job, and... Kit, will you marry me, Kit? I'll look after you. I'll always look after you. You don't know about me. You couldn't want to marry me now. I know everything about you. I've been out looking for you every night since you ran away. I'll oh, say you will, Kit. And I promise you, you'll never regret it. Are you sure that you can land that job, Roger? Certainly. I can be out of here in a week. Why don't you leave me? I've got Emmy into all this trouble. Roger's asking you to marry him, Kitty. Oh. You don't have to say yes right now. Let me get out of here, Kit, and then you can think about it. You're just being kind, Roger. No, I'm not just being kind. I love you. I've always loved you. Emmy knows that, don't you, Emmy? Hmm. Well, we'll still need a week. Kitty's got to have rest. You've got to land this job. Send Frisbee in here, Roger. And whatever you do, you keep your temper with him. Everything depends on that. I'll settle with Frisbee myself, Emmy. No, no. You have to rely on his reference to get to the head office. I know exactly what to do if you leave this part to me. Now, you get Frisbee here. Stay here, Kitty. All right. We'll try it your way. Oh, uh, Mrs. Peel. Don't worry, Kit. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, so you've decided to come back. Mr. Frisbee? Or... I've sent for Mr. Frisbee, Mrs. Peel. Oh. Well, uh, now you see what happens when you presume to take my place on the staff, Miss Slee. Please, Mrs. Peel. Well, 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 here we are again. Prodigal and truant in double harness, eh? I had an idea you'd turn up together. Mr. Frisbee, I've got something to say to you. Have you have a good deal to say, if I'm not mistaken, and so has this, uh, somewhat independent young lady. My word, you're looking somewhat the worse for wear, aren't you, Miss Tape? I'll give you three minutes to get your things. Go upstairs and lie down, Kitty. Yeah, just a moment, just Do a moment. Do as I say, Kitty. And tell Mr. Baddington that Mr. Frisbee will see him in one moment. Very well, Emmy. And who? 
is Mr. Barrington? The court welfare missionary. Court missionary now? Are you going to tolerate this another moment, Mr. Frisbee? You'd better listen, both of you. Why? What have you got to say? Mr. Barrington has just escorted Kitty over here from the South London Infirmary. He's now waiting outside. There are some papers to sign. Now then, do you want him in, or are you going to listen to me? I don't want the firm to get mixed up with any police court people. What was she doing in the infirmary? She was taken there after she tried to commit suicide. Good heavens. Is that what the missionaries come about? No. He... Well, what made her do a thing like that? For the same reason that a good many other girls throw themselves into canals, Mr Frisbee. You don't mean she's going to have a child? She was. Oh. But a fortnight ago, she threw herself into the Surrey Canal. There was no guardrail where she went in, so they think she fell in by accident. And there's no charge against her. Oh. Well, she can't stay here. You and she could both get out. I'm sure Sir Roswell wouldn't like to hear about this. Would he, Mr Frisbee? Do you think Sir Oswald would keep a girl like that on his premises? Of course he wouldn't. But what have Kitty and I to lose? If I sent the missionary up west to see Sir Oswald, I don't think that either of you would come out very creditably, do you? You go to Sir Oswald and be damned. This isn't my concern, it's Mrs Peel's. Mine? She's housekeeper here and she's paid to handle this sort of thing. I'm not. I'm business manager and this has nothing to do with me. Oh, I think it has, George. Huh? Well, if you look at it all the way round. Get out of here. Confound you. I'm leaving here too, George, and I've got nothing to lose. You'd better do what Emmy says, in case she persuades me to uh, take a trip up to headquarters. I could always say I was asking Sir Oswald for protection now, couldn't I? All right, but I'll get even with you for this if it takes me a lifetime, Slee. And you too, Muirhead. Temper, George. Be temper. quiet. Where is this missionary? He's waiting in the passage with the back door. And thank you so much, Mr Frisbee. I was quite sure you'd see my point of view. Ah. <laughs> What's the latest, Esther? They're all shut up in Mrs Peel's sitting room. Mrs Peel herself, Mr Frisbee, Emmy and Sir Oswald too. Oh, and Mr Higgins. What's happened to him? Oh, he's packing. They sacked him without even a week's notice money. Oh, the way he started giving Frisbee and Sir Oswald pieces of his mind. <gasps> Out on his ear. Oh, what a shame. And Kitty? Oh, she's sitting up there on her bed saying nothing. Just sitting and... Looking fit to drop, poor kid. Oh, there's my husband to be calling me. Oh, well. Bye bye, Mort. I'm off now. Oh, I'm leaving too now. So if you wait till I get my hat on straight, I'll come down with you. All right. Oh, it's going to be lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Mixing in with all the crowd and everything. <laughs> Not for me. Goldfish and I are getting far away from it. Oh, come on, come on. Don't take all day with that hat. Oh, I'm coming now. Coming? Very well, Sir Oswald. Oh, oh dear. Oh. Emmy. Uh, oh, uh, y yes, Roger. What did they decide about Kitty? Uh, Sir Oswald's going to see her himself directly. The procession's gone by. Mm. Well, they can't do a thing to it except sack her. Emmy, I'm going to take her away. Where? What? I said, where, Roger? You've lost your job. And you won't get a character reference, and you'll never land another billet without one. I'm going after some full-time political work. I see. And what's the pay? Very low, I'm afraid. Mm. You won't get a chance to take Kitty, Roger. She's a foundling, and Sir Oswald says he's legally responsible for her till she's 18. He's sending her to a home for girls. What did you say? Yes, I know. But that's what he said, a girl's home. Well, he can't do that. She hasn't done anything wrong. I've heard of those places, Emmy. They're like prisons. The girls are boarded out as drudges and it's a criminal offence to abscond. They, they can't do that to her. They're going to do it in about 20 minutes' time. But there must be some way. Yes. Yes, there is a way if you listen to me. Down at the infirmary, I signed papers accepting responsibility for Kitty until she's of age. It was witnessed by a member of the Board of Guardians. 
and he says that the latest document will hold good. So that makes me Kitty's legal guardian. Oh, then it's all right. You only have to tell them that and we can take our time. It's not all right, Roger. And there isn't much time. Why not? Well, you see, I, I'm dying, Roger. What? This pain of mine. But you've always said it was nothing. Oh, well. But I can't pass it off so lightly anymore. I've been to Guy's hospital. And there's nothing they can do for me. Oh, Emmy. No. No, Roger, don't waste tears on me. Now, I've got a plan for you, but it means you and Kitty leaving London immediately. But you, Emmy, what about you? Oh, it sounds wild, but I don't see why it shouldn't work. You only need a clean start, both of you, and you're young. And that's the best thing in the world. Now, here. What's this? To help you get that clean start. It's just short of 60 sovereigns. Oh, no, I couldn't take your money. It's for Kitty. I saved it for her. But... No, don't protest about anything. Just listen to me. Here. Here's a letter to my brother-in-law. He's got a farm at Cheshire. And you could work with him. You're young and you're strong and you'll love it. And so will she. All right, Emmy. I'm prepared to do what you ask. But Kitty will never leave without you. And suppose you leave Kitty to me. But couldn't just leave you either of us. Roger, I beg you to do it for her sake. And mine. I know I have to die soon, but I'll die happy if I can only know that Kitty's happy. Happy with you, Roger. Oh, please. Emmy. Oh, come in here, Kit. Come close the door. What is it? Kitty, darling. You're going away. What? Roger's taking you away to my brother-in-law's farm in Cheshire. The one I told you about. Oh, it'll be lovely, dear. You'll enjoy it so much. A aren't you coming too? No, no, I, I won't be able to come. I won't go without no, you. Well, I mean, I, I won't be able to come for a while, but you must go, kid. Otherwise, Sir Oswald will send you away, and you wouldn't like it where he'd want to send you. But, but why aren't you coming now? It's, it's a question of money. It's all right. Like, I've got to stay on and collect my wages and all lots of things. But, but I don't understand. Why should they? You must trust me, Kit, and do what I say this minute. Emmy's right, Kit. We'll uh, explain everything to you later. Will you come, my dear? I know I can make you happy if I get you away from all of this. Well, if Emmy says it's right, it's right. That's the way. Stay here, Kit. I just have to pack the rest of my things and then we can go. There won't be a moment. Oh, kids. You're going to love farming. I know you will. I'm sure I will, Emmy. You know, I can't imagine Roger loving me. That's only because you can't imagine love yet. Not fully. But he does love you so much. He'll make you the happiest woman in the world, my darling. Yes, I have a feeling you're right about that, too. Is that the bagpipes? Mm -hmm. Yes, Emmy, look, it's the Queen coming by. I saw her, Emmy. I saw the Queen. Did you, darling? How wonderful for me. Yes, it was. Oh, my things, I must go and pack my things. Yes, darling. Then when you finish, go to Roger's River. Oh, I won't be here when you come down again. I'm going out, you see it. But I'll see you soon. Very soon? I hope so. Amy, I love you. And I love you, kid. There. Now, go and pack. And go to Roger. Bless you, Amy. Write and let me know when you're coming down to us. Yes. I'll be waiting for you. Bye. Oh, what a lovely day. What an absolutely perfect day. So ends our Caltech's play, The Queen Came By. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltex Theatre.
Ladies and gentlemen, the producer of tonight's Caltex play, Kresik Jenkinson. Thank you. The Queen Came By was written by R.F. Delderfield and adapted for radio by John Crane. In the starring role you heard... I played Emmy. This was Neva Carglin. <laughs> the supporting cast was as follows. Kitty Juliana Allen. Roger Graham Hill. Esther Moya O'Sullivan. Frisby Gordon Chater. Albert Keith Buckley. Mrs. Peel Winifred Green. And Maud Rosemary Webster. Mr. Jenkinson. Next week in the Caltex Theatre, you will hear a gay and witty comedy from the London stage, The Policeman and the Lady, the light-headed, light-hearted tale of America's richest woman who hunted husbands on a Mediterranean island and wound up with more men than she could handle. Be listening next week for The Policeman and the Lady. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding for The Policeman and the Lady. Now this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night on behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltex Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world-famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil and Marfac Lubrication. Welcome to the Caltex Theatre, a full hour of dramatic entertainment broadcast over a nationwide network of stations throughout Australia. The Caltex Theatre is brought to you by Caltex Oil, marketers of over a thousand outstanding petroleum products in association with Caltex dealers and distributors everywhere. <laughs> Tonight in the Caltex Theatre you will hear The Third Husband, an adaptation from Somerset Maugham's great comedy, Home and Beauty. This is the story of Victoria Cardew, whose husband Bill is reported killed. She then marries her husband's best friend, Frederick. Back, however, comes Bill, husband number one, who is not dead. And with a third husband, Lester, in the offing, Victoria suddenly finds herself swamped with spouses. Starring tonight, you will hear Margaret Christensen, Alan White and Leonard Bullen. The Caltex Theatre presents The Third Husband, Act One. This is a story about a young woman. Young lady, please. I beg your pardon. This is a story about a young lady named Victoria. She was born Victoria Shuttleworth. But that's not my name now. No. Shuttleworth is not Victoria's name now. She's been married. Twice. Yes, twice. Three times if you count the third husband. My name at the moment is Mrs... Don't say it. You'll spoil the end of the story. Oh, sorry. Well, as I was saying... Victoria lived in her comfortable house in Westminster right through the war, from 1914 up to November 1918, when our story really commences. She lived there with her first two husbands. One at a time? One at a time, of course. They were both heroes, and they both had the DSO. I flatter myself there aren't many women who've been married to two DSOs. I think I've done my bit. Dear Frederick, and poor dear Bill... Oh, dear. Look, perhaps you'd like to tell this story yourself. All right, if you like. You take a little rest. I give up. Well, 
I was married to Bill first. You know, Major William Cardew, DSO. I adored Bill. But then, uh, when we got word that he was killed at Ypres, I married Frederick, Major Frederick Lance, who was Bill's best friend. I adored Freddy, too, you know. I went into mourning for a year for Bill first before I married Freddy. Of course, black does suit me. And when the baby was born, uh, Freddy's and mine, I mean, I called him William after my first husband. My mother didn't quite approve of that. I remember she brought it up one afternoon just after the armistice when she came to call on me in my bedroom at the house in Westminster. But surely, my darling, calling Freddy's son William will always remind you of how you lost Bill. And I shouldn't think Freddy would like it very much. Freddy has me now, Mother. He can't grudge it if I give a passing thought to that poor dead hero who's lying in a nameless grave in France. Oh, don't upset yourself, dear. You know how bad it is for your skin. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, I won't lose Freddy. Now he's got a nice, safe job at the war office. And he just adores being married to me. In your place, I'd have married Lester Payton. Men who wear spats always make the best husbands. <laughs> it's a sign of an orderly mind. It's more often a sign of cold feet. <laughs> I expect he wears bed socks, and I should hate that. Anyway, I was a soldier's widow. I don't think it would have been patriotic to marry a civilian like Lester Payton. Oh, patriotism and heroism are all very well. But at a party, not nearly as useful as a faculty for small talk. Excuse me, madam. What is it, Taylor? Mr. Lester Payton is here, madam. I said I didn't know if you could see him. Talk of the devil. Bring him up here, Taylor. Very good, madam. There. I knew I was right. I knew you attracted him. Oh, mother darling, I could never think of anyone but Freddy. But of course, it's useful to have someone like Lester to run errands for me. And he can wangle almost anything one wants. Butter? Even butter. <laughs> Sugar, anything at all. Mr. Lester Payton. Ah, oh, my dear, Mrs. Lance. Ah, Mrs. Shuttleworth. I hope you don't mind being dragged right upstairs to the bedroom, Mr. Payton. But my bedroom and the nursery are the only two rooms we can spare coal for to have fires, so I'm receiving in here. Oh, but why didn't you let me know you had trouble getting coal? It's out of the question that a pretty woman shouldn't have everything she wants. After all, what's the use of being on the rationing commission if one can't have some sort of pull? Dear Mr. Payton, you're a perfect marvel. Victoria deserves consideration. She's worked like a dog all through the war, you know. I can't remember how many committees I've been on, and I've sold at 23 bazaars. Have you stocked your teas for wounded soldiers, dear? Oh, yes, after the armistice. Oh. I used to invite a dozen every Thursday, Mr. Payton. At first I had them in the drawing room, but that made them shy, poor dears. So I thought it would be nicer if they had it in the servants' hall. I'm the only woman I know who never had the smallest trouble keeping her maids during the war. Oh. Uh, darling, uh, I think I'll go to the nursery and see how my dear little grandson is. And you and Lester can have a nice long talk together, eh? All right, Mother. Poor little darling. He has a cold. I'm so worried. You're a wonderful mother, Mrs. Lance. And a perfect wife. Do you think so, Mr. Payton? Uh, doesn't your uh, a husband? Oh, Freddy's only my husband. His opinion doesn't count. Victoria! Uh, Victoria! Oh, hello, Payton. Freddy, where have you been? You promised to take me out for lunch. Bill never forgot his appointments with me. Didn't he? Fancy that. Well, um... <clears throat> <laughs> I, I think I'll be um, getting along. Um, goodbye, Mrs. Lund. Goodbye, Mr. Payton. So nice of you to come and see me. And I'll see to that other matter right away. Uh, good day, Alonzo old chap. Goodbye. Victoria, are you obliged to receive visitors in your bedroom? <laughs> Is he a jealous hubby then? You silly old thing. You know, it's the only room in the house that's got a fire. No coal, no fire. Why the dickens don't you have one in the drawing room where we could all benefit by it, instead of here where it's no good to anyone but you? I don't know how you can be so unkind to me. Do I have to remind you that my nerves are still shattered from the shock of Bill's death? I was mad to think of marrying you. Mad, mad, mad. I shall never be happy again. I would give anything in the world to have my dear, dear Bill back again. I'm glad you feel like that about it. Because he'll be here in about three minutes. 
What? What? Oh, what on earth do you mean? Bill Cardew will be here in a few minutes. He rang me up at the club a little while ago. But, 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 but Bill's dead. He showed no sign of it on the telephone. But, <laughs> but you know he was killed. He was reported dead by the war office. I wore mourning and everything. We even had a memorial service. I know. It'll take a devil of a lot of explaining turning up like this. Oh, I shall go stark staring mad in a moment. How do you know it was Bill talking on the telephone? He said so. That proves nothing. Lots of people say they're the Kaiser. Yes, but they speak from a lunatic asylum. He spoke from Waterloo Station. <laughs> well, what did he say exactly? What did he say? Well, somebody said, Is that you, Freddy? Uh, I thought I recognised the voice and I felt all funny. Yes, I said. It's me, Bill, he said. Bill Cardew. For heaven's sake, be quick about it. Uh, hello, I said. I, I thought you were dead. Uh, I thought as much, he answered. Uh, how are you, I said. A1, he said. What an idiotic conversation. Well, darn it all, I had to say something. <laughs> uh, anyway, he said, you might break it to Victoria. Righto, I said. He said, so long. And I said, so long. And we rang off. Good heavens. You know, it puts me in a devilish awkward position. You? What about me? Well, Bill may think it's rather funny that I married his wife. Funny? On the other hand, he may not. Uh, and you say he'll be here any minute? Oh, dear, I haven't even time to change my frock. What the deuce do you want to change your frock for? Well, after all, I am his widow. I think it would be only nice of me to be wearing mourning when he comes. <laughs> um, what did he say when you told him we'd married? I didn't tell him. It's rather a delicate thing to chat about over the telephone. Anyway, I think you're the best person to do that. I? 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 Do you think I'm going to do all your dirty work? Y you just take him by the arm and say, Look here, old man, the fact it's is... It's no use, Victoria. I won't do it. Listen to me, Frederick Lance. Hello! Hello, Victoria! Why, George, here he comes. Oh. Well, 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 here we are again, eh? Bill! That's all right. <laughs> I can hardly believe my eyes. Give me a kiss, old lady. Mm. Well, Freddy, old man, how's life? Uh, A1, thanks. <laughs> Jolly good of you to come and welcome me home, old man. Hoped you would, but I was half afraid you'd have some stupid feeling of delicacy about being here in the house when I arrived. <laughs> what, I? <laughs> uh, struck me you... <laughs> struck me you might think Victoria and I'd want to be alone just the first moment. But I'd have been sorry not to have your ugly old face here to welcome me. Uh, well, darling. Uh, it's just like old times to hear you call me darling. It's one of Victoria's favourite words. You know, I nearly didn't warn you. I thought it would be rather a lark to break in on you in the middle of the night. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, quite a lark. I'm just as glad you didn't do that, Bill. <laughs> what, a, what a scene upon my word, eh? The sleeping beauty upon her virtuous couch. Enter man in shocking old suit. Shrieks from sleeping beauty. It is I, your husband, Tableau. I think, I think the little lamb is getting along nicely, Victoria. <laughs> Mother, I... Hello, eh? What? what? Who? Who is that? Well, I may be a bit thinner, and this certainly is a shocking suit, but it's still me, Bill. Oh, don't come near me. I shall scream. You're dead. He... <laughs> he doesn't seem to know it. Oh, but it's absurd. Will somebody waken me up? Shall I pinch her? And if so, where? <laughs> the war office said you were dead. We had a memorial service. Fully coral. That was very nice of you, Victoria. It was very well attended. I'm glad it wasn't a frost. Uh, I say, old man, uh, we don't want to hurry you, you know, but we'd like some sort of explanation. Oh, yes. Well, I was wounded, not killed, and the Huns picked me up and took me to Germany. I, I think I must have been rather dotty for a bit. Couldn't remember a thing. Memory completely gone. So I couldn't write to you or anything, Victoria. But your memory came back later? Uh, gradually. And, of course, I realised then that you'd think I was dead. So as soon as I was released after the armistice, I got back as fast as I could to break the news to you myself. And here I am. Yes, here you are. <sighs> A new spring mattress on our bed, I see. Father will sleep without rocking tonight. Freddy, tell him. No, you. Something's got to be done. Done? What do you mean? Uh, Mother means about the baby's cold. Baby? Victoria, a baby? I didn't know. Wonderful. Boy or girl? A boy named William. 
After you, you know. Well, uh, <laughs> darling, I, I didn't know. I, I never guessed when I went away to the war three years ago that I... <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, darling. How, how, how old is the baby? Four months. <laughs> Four months, eh? Four months? <laughs> Victoria! Bill, I... You... We... Uh, that is... Oh, Freddy, say something, even... Now, look here, old man. The, the fact is, you've made rather an absurd mistake. You've been away so long that there's a good deal you don't know. Apparently. <laughs> I'm a simple creature. Uh, well, to cut a long story short, the infant in the nursery is... is not your son. I had a sort of suspicion it wasn't, I tell you that, Frank. <laughs> Well, who the devil is the father? Well, in, in point of fact, uh, uh, I am. <laughs> you? Freddie, you don't mean to tell me you're married. Well, lots of people are, you know. In fact, marriage has been quite the thing during the war. Well, I'm jolly glad to hear it. I, I knew you'd be caught one of these days. Congratulations. Bill! Oh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, I'm staying here, you know. Oh, are you? That's first rate. I is your missus staying with us, too? Uh, my... Oh, oh well... That's rather difficult to explain. Frederick, I can't stand this suspense. You tell him. Fred, you don't mean to say you've married Victoria's mother? No. <laughs> N not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? I hope you haven't been trifling with the affections of my mother-in-law. Oh, do I look as if I were the mother of a four-month-old baby? <laughs> well, we live in an age of progress. <laughs> One should keep an open mind about such things. Uh, you quite misunderstand me, Bill. We are not married. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have liked to be your son-in-law, Freddy. But if you've compromised Mrs. Shuttleworth, don't you think you ought to marry her? He hasn't compromised her and he can't marry her. I don't want to seem inquisitive, but if you didn't marry Victoria's mother, who did you marry? Dash it all, I married Victoria! <laughs> Dear Mr. Payton, it was sweet of you to come and see me this morning. I was afraid you wouldn't have time. The moment you telephoned me and told me you had taken shock at the appalling thought of having two existing husbands, I came at once, dear lady. Why do you call me, dear lady? Out of pure um, embarrassment. I don't know now whether to call you Mrs. Cardew or Mrs. Lance. Why don't you split the difference and call me Victoria? What? May I? It'll make me feel that you're not entirely a stranger to me. Oh, dear Victoria, uh, let me kiss your hand. Why? Your, your wedding rings. You always used to wear two. As long as I thought poor Bill was dead, I, I didn't want to forget him. But, but why have you removed them both? I'm all at sea. I'm married to two men, and I feel as though I were married to neither. Oh, why, with all my heart, you weren't. How emphatic you are. Why? Can't you guess? I must be very stupid. Don't you know that I, I dote upon you? I curse my unhappy fate that I did not meet you before you were married. Would you have asked me to marry you? Morning, noon, and night, until you consented. I'm not free, but uh, if I were... If you were? Lester... I wonder would you take me out to lunch today? Oh, Victoria! Oh, Victoria! Morning, Cardo. Morning, Lowndes. Sleep well? No. You? Awful. Cold down here in the drawing room, isn't it? Haven't noticed. Why don't you light the fire, then? Unpatriotic, Victoria says so. She has to have one in the bedroom, and we must have one in the nursery. Where the devil did you get that suit? Rather natty, eh? Victoria sent it in to me. Mine! The only new suit I've had since the war. Upon my soul, I think that's a bit thick. Well, if it comes to that, where did you get that pearl tie pin? Oh, Victoria gave it to me on my birthday. But it's mine. She gave it to me on my birthday first. Give it back to me. I'll see you blow first. At your death, you left everything to her in your will. If she chose to give this to me, it's none of your business. By the way, hmm? did you ever have a hammered gold cigarette case? Rather. That was Victoria's wedding present to me. Did you get it too? Thrifty woman, Victoria. 
I say, unless I have a fire here, I shall turn into the Albert Memorial. Well, there's one set there in the grate. Light it and see what happens. I think I will. Give me a match. Oh, use my lighter. Victoria, give you this? Yes. Me too. <laughs> ah, there. Victoria will be furious. That's your lookout. It's nothing to do with me. Your master in this house. Not at all. I am but an honoured guest. Nonsense. The moment you appeared, I sank into insignificance. Uh, where would you like me to clear out? My dear fellow, why should you wish to do that? Surely you don't for a moment imagine that I shall be in the way. I propose to make my visit quite a brief one. I'm sorry to hear that. Victoria will be disappointed. But of course it's no concern of mine. You and your wife must arrange things between you. My dear chap, you entirely misunderstand me. I am not the man to come between you and your wife. What the devil do you mean? Well, if it comes to that, what the devil do you mean? Good morning, Bill. Morning, Victoria. Good morning, Freddy. Morning, Victoria. I kissed Bill first, Freddy, because he's been away so long. Oh, naturally. And he was your husband long before I was. Oh! Who lit that fire? He did. But it was his lighter. Oh. Of course, you don't care if we run so short of coal that I freeze to death in my room upstairs. It's simply criminal not to be careful in wartime. But you didn't think of that when you married Freddy. <laughs> I did that for your sake, Bill, darling. He was such a pal of yours. She was simply inconsolable when you were killed. It's lucky you were there to console her. <laughs> but, Bill, darling, it was Freddy's wonderful friendship for you that won my heart. That's right, Bill. I, I know Victoria's faithful heart. She can never really love any man but you. Victoria, you know how I adore you. You're the only woman in the world for me. But I realize there's only one thing for me to do. Bill has come back. There's only one course open to me as a gentleman and a man of honour. It's a bitter, bitter sacrifice. But I am equal to it. I renounce all rights in you. I will go away, a wiser and a sadder man, and leave you to Bill. Goodbye, Victoria. Oh, how beautiful of you, Freddy. What a soul you've got. Goodbye, Victoria. Forget me and live happily with a better man than I. Goodbye, Bill. Be kind to her. I couldn't do this for anyone but you. I'm going out of your lives forever. Over my dead body? What? <laughs> what the devil do you mean? Get away from that door and let me leave. Oh, no, nothing doing. Bill! Bill, why prolong a painful scene? My dear Victoria, I am not a man to accept a sacrifice like Freddy's. No, the war office has decided that I'm dead. You've had a memorial service. You've been in mourning. You're happy. It would be monstrously selfish if I disturbed the state of things which is so eminently satisfactory to you both. No, I will not come between you. Oh, Bill, how noble! Now, wait a minute. Victoria, <laughs> to all intents and purposes, I am as dead as mutton. I will remain so. But Victoria will never be happy with me now that you've come back. Not another word. She is yours. My dear Bill. You know me very little. I'm lazy, selfish, bad-tempered, mean, gouty, and predisposed to several contagious diseases. Freddy, old man, I can no longer conceal from you that with a constitution ruined by dissipation in my youth and broken by the ravages of war, I have not much longer to live. Besides, Victoria knows only too well that I am vindictive and overbearing, extravagant, violent, and mendacious. You must have her. No, you, old chap, I insist. No, no, old man, I must decline you. You! You! Oh, I understand it all. You're both so noble, you're both so heroic, you're both so unselfish. But I cannot have two husbands, really I cannot. I have an idea. It's sure to be a rotten one. Let's draw lots. I knew it was a rotten one. How do you mean, Freddy? Well, we'll take two pieces of paper. Oh, here, there's some on the desk. And I'll put a cross on one of them. So, and fold them up, like this, and put them in a hat. Oh, here we are. Now we'll draw. And the one who gets the cross gets Victoria. Oh, that'll be rather thrilling. And whoever draws the blank paper renounces all claim to Victoria. He vanishes from the scene like a puff of smoke. He'll never be heard of again. I don't like it. I do it under protest. You take the hat, Victoria. Now shake it. Shake it well. All right. Isn't this exciting? There now. You draw first, Freddy. All right. There. I'll unfold the paper now. Well, Freddy, is it the one with the cross? No, blank, blank, blank. And mine's the one with the cross. Oh, my poor Freddy. Don't, don't 
Pity me, Victoria. I want all my courage now. I've lost you, and I must bid you goodbye forever. Oh, no, Freddy, that would be too awful. You must come to afternoon tea from time to time. I couldn't. That's more than I could bear. <laughs> I shall never forget you. You're the only woman I've ever loved. Goodbye. I go into the night. Oh, aren't you going at once? I am. Well, it happens to be the middle of the day. I was speaking <laughs> in the Before you go, Freddy, I should like to have a look at your bit of paper. The one with the blank. The one with the blank? But, yes. But why? Mere curiosity. Really, Bill, I don't know how you can be so heartless as to give way to curiosity when my heart is one great aching wound. Anyway, I threw it in the fire. Oh, no, you didn't. You put it in your pocket. Here. Oh, but take your hand out of my pocket. Not till I get that piece of paper. Stop it! Hit him on the head with a poker, Victoria. Don't be unladylike, Victoria. <laughs> Got it. You dirty dog. <laughs> What's the matter? Look, Victoria, this is Freddy's blank slip of paper. Why, it's got a cross on it. They both had crosses on them. I don't understand. Don't you? He was making quite sure that I shouldn't draw a blank. What? I don't... Freddy! I did it for your sake, Victoria. I knew that your heart was set on Bill, only you couldn't bear to hurt my feelings, so I thought I'd make it easier for you. You see? May I speak to you for a minute, madam? What? Oh, not now, Taylor. I'm busy. I'm afraid it's very urgent, madam. Oh? Oh, very well. I'll come. Don't say anything important until I come back. Either of you. Come along, Taylor. Yes, madam. How did you guess? About the two crosses, I mean. You were so devilish calm about it all. That was the calm of despair. One might almost think you didn't want Victoria. It's not that exactly. No man could want a better wife. No, she's pretty. Charming, lightful. Uh... I confess that sometimes I thought it hard that when I wanted a thing it was selfishness and when she wanted it, it, it was only her due. And I don't mind admitting that sometimes I used to wonder why it was only natural for me to sacrifice my inclinations, but in her it was proof of a beautiful nature. I have asked myself on occasions why my time was of no importance, while, while hers was so precious. I did sometimes wish I could call my soul my own. The fact is, I'm not worthy of her, Bill. As you so justly say, no man could want a better wife. No, you said that. But I'm fed up. If you had been dead, I'd have seen you through like a gentleman, but you've turned up like a bad shilling. Now you take up the white man's burden. I'll see you hanged first. But she must have one husband, and she must choose between us. Oh, that's not giving me a chance. I've got a charming nature, and I'm extremely handsome. Victoria will naturally choose me. Well, heaven knows I'm not vain, but I've always been given to understand that I'm an almost perfect specimen of manly beauty. <laughs> My conversation is not only amusing, but instructive. Now listen here. Well, really, all the servants have given notice now because they don't approve of my having two husbands. Oh, well, Freddie and I will do the housework until you get some more. Or whichever one of us you choose to keep. Oh, how can I choose? I adore you both. Besides, there's so little to choose between you. Oh, I don't know about that. Freddie has a charming nature and he's extremely handsome. Uh, but, Bill, I must tell you to your face that you're an almost perfect specimen of manly beauty. <laughs> And your conversation is not only amusing, but instructive. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, before you decide, I feel it only fair to make a confession to you. Victoria, in my department, there's a stenographer. She's of the feminine gender. She has blue eyes and little yellow curls at the nape of her neck. With well, the rest, I leave to your imagination. Really? Frederick! Well, that certainly simplifies matters. I can't quite see myself as the third lady in the back row of a harem. You'd run no risk of being that in Canada. Women are scarce in Manitoba. What are you talking about? Victoria, I have come to the conclusion that England offers me no future. Make me the happiest of men and we'll emigrate together. To Canada? Where the sables come from? Not the best ones. I shall buy a farm. I think it would be a very good plan if you employ your leisure until then in learning to cook the simple fare on which we shall live. And how to milk cows? I hate cows. I see the idea appeals to you. <laughs> It'll be a wonderful life, Victoria. You'll light the fire and scrub the floors and cook the dinner and wash the clothes. Simple but good. And what will I do in my spare moments? We will cultivate your mind by reading the Encyclopedia Britannica together. <laughs> Take a good look at us, Victoria, me and Freddie, and say which of us it's to be. To tell you the truth, I don't see why it should be either. What's what? 
The war is over now, and I think I've done my bit. I've married two DSOs. Now I want to marry a Rolls Royce. But I thought you adored us. Well, you see, I adore you both. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other, and the result is... A washout. Hang it all, I think it's a bit thick. You mean you fixed up to marry someone else behind our backs? Pardon me, madam. Yes, Taylor? Mr. Lester Payton is downstairs in his car, madam. Is it the Rolls Royce? I think it is, madam. Excuse me, gentlemen. You see, the Rolls Royce is taking me out to lunch. Well. Well. Well, 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 well. <laughs> <laughs> And so the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Caltech Theatre play, The Third Husband. If you care for your car, fill up with the gasoline designed to take better care of your car's performance. If you're already a confirmed Caltex man, you'll know what we mean. If you're not, fill up with Caltex Butane Boosted Gasoline and see what a performance difference there is. Caltex Butane Boosted Gasoline gives faster starts, smoother acceleration, and more economical running. The gasoline designed for today's faster pace, Caltex Butane Boosted Gasoline, takes better care of your car's performance. Drive in for Caltex Butane Boosted Gasoline at the sign of the Caltex Star, where we take better care of your car. The Caltex Theatre now presents Margaret Christensen, Alan White, and Leonard Bullen in The Third Husband, Act Two. Well, where were we? Oh, yes, I went off to lunch with Lester Payton. <laughs> Dear Lester, he always orders nothing but the best, and I left Freddie and Bill, my two husbands, at home to work things out between them. And what they did was to decide that Freddy should take care of the housework in the absence of my servants, while Bill did all the cooking. <laughs> A day or two of that, and tempers became rather heated in the kitchen. Very heated indeed. Your trouble, Freddy, is that you have no organization. I have organization. That's my secret of success. I was a mug to say I'd do the housework. I might have known you'd freeze onto a soft, warm job like cooking. Cooking is an art. Any fool can do housework. I'll give you a thick ear in a minute. Just try and shine a pair of boots and see if it's easy. I don't believe you know the secret of polishing boots. Did you spit on them? No, only on the silverware. <laughs> well, you'd better get that table laid. I'm going to finish this book while the food cooks. Is it luncheon or dinner? Well, I don't know yet, but we're having it here in the kitchen because it's easier for dishing up. Organization again. I don't know what Victoria will say to that. She's in an awful temper this morning. The water in her bathroom wasn't hot. Well, cold baths are much better for people. Healthy. Tell that to the horse marines. You were too lazy to get up in time and light the fire. That's all there is to it. I wish you'd let me finish this book. I want to find out if the nursery governess marries the Duke after all. You want to read it when I finish? I don't have time for reading. When I take on a job, I like to do it properly. Ooh, he's just glued his lips to hers. Well, the steak smells as though it's almost done. Done? It's only been on for a quarter of an hour. <laughs> but in a grill room, they do your steak in ten minutes. You cook meat a quarter of an hour for every pound. I should have thought any fool knew that. Well, what's that got to do with it? There's three pounds of steak, so I'm going to cook it for three quarters of an hour. <laughs> but look here, if there were three steaks of a pound each, you cooked them a quarter of an hour each. Exactly. Three quarters of an hour altogether. I really think it's too bad of you. I've been ringing the bell for the last quarter of an hour. There are two men in the house, and you neither of you pay me the least attention. We were having an argument about the steak I'm cooking you for luncheon. I shan't be in for luncheon. Why not? Because... Because Mr. Lester Payton has made me an offer of marriage, and I have accepted it. What? But you've got two husbands already, Victoria. I imagine you'll both be gentlemen enough to put no obstacle in the way of my getting my freedom. <laughs> that will be my solicitor, Mr. A.B. Rahn. I asked him to come and fix up my divorce. Uh, go and open the door, will you, Freddy? All right. You're not letting the grass grow under your feet, are you? <laughs> so you've quite made up your mind to divorce me? Quite. Oh. In that case, I can almost look upon you as another man's wife. What do you mean by that? 
Only that I can make love to you now without feeling a thundering ass. Mm. Oh, mm. Bill! <laughs> what a pity it is you're ever my husband. I'm sure you'd make a charming lover. I've often thought that's the better part. <laughs> Take care. I can hear them coming. It'd never do for my solicitor to find me in my husband's arms. <laughs> no, it'd be outrageous. We're all out here in the kitchen, Mr. Rahm. Would you come through? How do you do, Mr. Rahm? Uh, do you know my husband's? Ah, I'm pleased to meet you, gentlemen. Uh, I, I dare say it would facilitate matters if I were told which of you is which and uh, which is the other. Uh, this is Major Cardew, my first husband, and this is Major Lowndes, my second husband. Uh, you can quite understand that this is a position of some delicacy for Mrs. Cardew? Mrs. Cardew? Oh, you mean Mrs. Lowndes. Well, which is she? No matter, the fact is she's decided to be neither. I've just broken that news to them. You find us still staggering from the shock. Staggering. Do I understand that um, uh, both you gentlemen are agreeable to being divorced? Speaking for myself, I am prepared to sacrifice my feelings, deep as they are, to the happiness of Victoria. Mm, very nicely and feelingly put. Bill always was a gentleman. And you, Major Lowndes, uh, will you give this lady the freedom she desires? I will. When did I last say those words? Of course, the marriage service. Well, uh, so far, so good. Now, details. We can arrange everything here and now. Uh, Mrs. Cardew Lowndes, uh, in England, when a wife desires to divorce her husband, she must prove either cruelty or desertion. Uh, uh, which do you propose to use? Personally, I should prefer desertion. Certainly. I should very much dislike to be cruel to you, Victoria. And you know, I could never hurt a fly. Then we will settle on desertion. I, I think myself it is the more gentlemanly way. Besides, it's more easily proved. The procedure is excessively simple. Uh, uh, Mrs. Cardew Lowndes will write each of you a letter. A letter which I shall dictate, asking you to return to her, the usual phrases uh, uh, to make a home for her, and you will refuse. I propose that you should both give me your refusals now. Before we've had the letter? Precisely. <laughs> the letter which she will write, and which is read out in court, is so touching that on one occasion the husband, uh, about to be divorced, was so moved that he immediately returned to his wife. Mm. She was very angry indeed. So now I invariably get the refusal first. Yes, it's, um, it's so difficult to write an answer to a letter that hasn't been written. Uh -huh. <laughs> to meet that difficulty, I, I, I have also prepared, prepared the replies. Here we are. Uh, they're typed, requiring only your signatures. There, Major Cardew. They're on Hotel Majestic note paper. Mm, you'll see the point later. Here is yours, Major Lowndes. Are they both the same? Oh, certainly not. I have two letters that I generally make use of, and I propose that you should each of you use one of them. The theme of one is sorrow rather than anger. The other is rather vituperative. Uh, you can decide between you which of you had better send which. Well, they both habitually swore at me, but I think Bill's language was more varied. Mm, that settles it. Uh, uh, Major Lowndes, you had better sign this letter. Read it first if you care to. Uh, uh, my dear Victoria, I have given your letter anxious consideration. If I thought there was any hope of our making a greater success of married life in the future than we have in the past, I should be the first to suggest that we should make one more attempt. Very touching. Uh, read on. But I have regretfully come to the conclusion that to return to you would only be to cause a recurrence of the unhappy life from which I know you have suffered no less than I. I am bound, therefore, definitely to refuse your request. I do not propose under any circumstances to return to you. Yours sincerely? Uh, uh, that's where you sign your full name, Major Lowndes. A very nice letter, Freddy. I shall always think pleasantly of you. <laughs> I have my points. Now, Major Cardew, would you care to read your letter? Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> my dear Victoria, I am in receipt of your letter asking me to return to you. Our life together has been a hell upon earth, and I have long realized that our marriage was a tragic mistake. You have sickened me with scenes and tortured me with jealousy. If you have tried to make me happy, you have succeeded singularly ill. I trust I shall never see you again, and nothing in the world will induce me ever to resume a life which I can only describe as a miserable degradation. Bill, how could you write such a thing? Well, I, I... But now the crowning touch. Uh, mark the irony of the polite ending. I beg to remain yours most sincerely. Uh, that's where you sign your name. Oh. Yeah, I've signed it. And then that's settled. Now we only have to go into court, apply for a decree of restitution of conjugal rights, and six months later bring action for divorce. Six months later? 
Oh, but when shall I be free, then? Oh, in about a year. Oh, but that won't do at all. I must have my freedom at once. Oh, well, um, uh, in that case, the only thing is cruelty. Not cruelty. I could never strike a woman. If I don't mind, I don't see why you should. And my mother will swear she witnessed anything. Hmm. <laughs> Yes, but um, servants are better. But even then, one has to be careful. Uh, uh, once I remember, on my instructions, the guilty husband hit the lady I was acting for in the jaw, which unfortunately knocked out her false teeth. <laughs> the gentleman she had arranged to marry happened to be present, and he was so startled that he took the next steamer for Martinique and has never been heard of since. <laughs> well, I'm happy to say that Victoria's teeth are all her own. Mm, undoubtedly. I, I merely tell you that to show you what may happen. But I have devised my own system, and I, I've never known it to fail. I always arrange for three definite acts of cruelty. First, at the dinner table. Yes. Now, now, gentlemen, when you've tasted your soup, you throw down your spoon with a clatter and say, Good heavens, this soup is uneatable. Can't you get a decent cook? This soup is uneatable. Can't you get a decent cook? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you, madam, will answer... I do my best, darling, uh, upon which you gentlemen, crying out in a loud voice, take that, you fool, throw the plate straight at her. Oh, oh yes! <laughs> now, with a little ingenuity, the lady can dodge the plate of soup, and the only damage is done to the tablecloth. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the second act of cruelty is a little less violent. Um, I suppose you have a revolver. I can get one. Th th then... <laughs> Having carefully removed the cartridges, you ring the bell for a servant, and just as she opens the door, you point it at the lady and say, You lying devil, I'll kill you. Uh, then you, madam, give a loud shriek and cry to the maid, Oh, save me, save me. Oh, save me, save me. <laughs> I should love doing that. So dramatic. Now we come to physical as opposed to moral cruelty. It's as well to have two witnesses to this. The gentleman takes the lady by the throat, at the same time hissing malevolently, I'll throttle you if I swing for it, by heavens. Oh, oh, and it's very important to leave a bruise, so that the doctor, who should be sent for immediately, can swear to it. I'll throttle you if I swing for it, by heavens. Yeah, splendid, Major Lance, splendid. Yes, yeah, not bad at all. Oh, thank you. Now we come to a point um, uh, trivial enough in itself, but essential in order to satisfy the requirements of our English divorce laws. The matter of uh, <coughs> uh, infidelity. That I think you can safely leave to us. Oh, by no means. I think that would be most dangerous. But surely human nature can be trusted there. We are not dealing with human nature, we're dealing with the law. I always arrange this part of the proceedings with the most scrupulous regard to propriety. I will engage you a suite of rooms at the Majestic Hotel. You remember it was from there you wrote declining to return to your wife. The judge never fails to remark on the coincidence. On a date to be settled hereafter, you will come to my office where you will meet a lady. Do you mean to say you provide her too? Certainly. <laughs> What's she like? A most respectable person. I have employed her in these cases for many years. It sounds as though she made a business of it. She does. What? <laughs> yes, uh, she had the idea, a most ingenious one to my mind, that in these days of specialized professions, there was great need for someone to undertake the duties of intervener. Uh, that is the female equivalent of co-respondent in divorce, you know. She has been employed by the best legal firms in London and has figured in practically all the fashionable divorces for the last 15 years. You amaze me. Yes, a most unselfish, noble-minded woman. Uh, gentlemen, you will fetch this lady at my office and drive her to the Hotel Majestic, where you will register as Major and Mrs. Cardew, or Major and Mrs. Lowndes, as the case may be. You will be shown into the suite of rooms which I shall engage for you. Supper will be served in the sitting room. You will partake of this, and you will drink champagne. I would like to choose the brand myself. Oh, I have no objection to that. Thanks. Then you will play cards. Cards? <laughs> Miss Montmorency is a wonderful card player. She not only has an unparalleled knowledge of all games for two, but she can do a great number of tricks. In this way, you will find the night will pass without tediousness. And in the morning, after you have paid your bill, you will take Miss Montmorency in a taxi cab and deposit her at my office. It sounds like a hell of a beaner. I should like to see her first. <laughs> ah, I took the liberty of bringing Miss Montmorency with me. 
She's waiting in the taxi at the door, and if you like, I'll go and fetch her. Splendid. I'll go along and bring her down here. Is she the sort of person I should like to meet, Mr. Rahm? Oh, a perfect lady. She comes from one of the best families in Shropshire. Do fetch her then, Freddy. Right you are. I'd like to take a look at her myself, you know. I should like to see her, Mr. Rahm. Men are so weak, and I shall be easier in my mind if I can be sure these poor boys won't be led astray. <laughs> Mr. Rahm, do you mean to say that with this evidence you'll be able to get a divorce? Not a doubt of it. I've got hundreds. Why on earth does such a state of affairs exist? Uh -huh. That is the question which at one time I often asked myself. I confess it seemed to me that when two married persons agreed to separate, it was nobody's business but their own. Then at last I hit upon the explanation. What was it then? Well, if the law were always wise and reasonable, it would be obeyed so easily that to obey the law would become an instinct. Now, it's not good for the community that the people should be too law-abiding. So our ancestors, in their wisdom, devised certain laws which were vexatious or absurd, so that men should break them, and therefore be led insensibly to break others. But why is it not good for the community that people should be too law-abiding? My dear sir, how else would the lawyers earn their living? <laughs> I see your point. You convinced me completely. Victoria! <laughs> She's coming. She's coming. Who's coming, Freddy? Miss Botmorency. Wait till you see her. Is this the way? Oh, come straight in, Miss Montmorency. You see, Bill, the other woman in our life. Holy smoke. Fifty if she's a day. Nearer sixty, I'd say. Oh, but this is the kitchen? I'm afraid it's the only room in the house that's habitable at the moment. To the practised observer, the signs of domestic infelicity jump to the eye, as the French say. Uh, Miss Montmorency, Mrs. Frederick Lowne. I'm charmed to make your acquaintance. The injured wife, I presume? Um, yes. Oh, so sad, so sad. I'm afraid the ward is responsible for the rupture of many happy marriages. I'm booked up for weeks ahead. <laughs> so sad, so sad. Uh, uh, do sit down, won't you? Mm, thank you. Uh, do you mind if I get out my notebook? I like to get everything clear, and my memory is not what it was. <clears throat> now, which of these gentlemen is the erring husband? Well, they both are. Oh, really? <laughs> and which are you going to marry after you've got your divorce? Uh, neither. Neither? Oh. It's a very peculiar case, Mr. Rahm. Uh, when I saw these two gentlemen, I naturally concluded that one was the husband Mrs. Frederick Lawrence was discarding, and the other the husband she was acquiring. The eternal triangle, you know? In this case, the triangle is four-sided. Oh. <laughs> very peculiar. Uh, we see a lot of strange things in our business, Miss Montmorency. Uh, you are informing me, as the French say. I don't want you to think I've been at all light or careless, but the fact is, through no fault of my own, they are both my husbands. Oh, really? Very interesting. And uh, which are you divorcing? I'm divorcing them both. Oh, I see. Uh, very sad, very sad. We're taking as cheerful a view of it as we can. Ah, yes, that's what I say to my clients. Courage, courage. Uh, Mr. Rahm, I think I ought to tell you at once that I shouldn't like to compromise... <laughs> I use the technical sense. I shouldn't like to compromise both these gentlemen. But, Miss Montmorency... I have to think of my self-respect. One gentleman is business. Two would be debauchery. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Lowndes is anxious to put this matter through as quickly as possible. Uh, yes, well, I, I do see my friend Mrs. Onslow Jarvis of Clacton would be oblige if I asked her as a personal favour. Are you sure she can be trusted? Oh, she's a perfect lady and most respectable. I'm all for Mrs. Onslow Jarvis, personally. Oh, uh, then uh, you fall to me, Major. Uh, uh, I didn't quite catch your name. Cardew, William Cardew. Oh, well, I hope you play cards, Major Cardew. Sometimes. I am a great card player. Such a relief to find a gentleman who's fond of cards. Otherwise, I dare say, the night seems rather long. Oh, no, no, not to me, you know. I'm such a student of human nature. But my gentlemen begin to grow a little restless when I've talked to them for six or seven hours. <laughs> I can hardly believe it. Oh, one gentleman actually said that he wanted to go to bed. But of course I told him that would never do. Forgive my asking, you know what men are. Do they never attempt to take any liberties with you? Oh, no. If you're a lady, you can always keep a man in his place. 
And Mr. Rom only takes the very best sort of cases. I assure you, Miss Montmorency, that you need have no fear that I shall take advantage of your delicate position. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Major Collier. I'm sure we shall have a delightful night. I can see that we have much in common. It's so good of you to say so. And, uh, Major Lawrence, I know you'll like Mrs. Onslow Jarvis, a perfect lady. She has so much charm of matter, such ease. They have a very nice class of people at Clacton. I shall be charmed to meet her. <laughs> and, Major Cardew, you will let me know in good time when you fix the fatal night. I'm very much booked up just now. Uh, of course, we'll do everything to suit your convenience, Miss Montmorency. And now, Mrs. Lowndes, uh, since we have settled everything, I think Miss Montmorency and I will go. I can't think of anything else. Uh, excuse me taking the liberty, Mrs. Frederick Lowndes, but after your great trouble is over, should you be wanting any face massage, may I give you my card? Oh, do you do face massage? Only for ladies who are personally recommended to me. Here is my card. Esmeralda Montmorency. Uh, yes, it's a pretty name, isn't it? I also make the Esmeralda cream. The Marchioness of Twickenham's face was simply ravaged when she was divorcing the Marquis. And believe me, after a course of twelve treatments, you would not have known her. I'll <laughs> certainly keep your card. Mm. Goodbye, then. I'm not going to say goodbye to you, Major Cardew, <laughs> but au revoir. Believe me, I look forward to our next meeting. Good morning, Mrs. Lowndes. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Shall we go out this way, Miss Montmorency? Oh, uh, the back steps? Oh, very well. So quaint and old-fashioned. Still, I always think a lady, if she is a lady, can do anything. Now, the only thing left is for me to bid you both goodbye. Won't you even stay to luncheon? I don't think I will, thanks. I think I shall get a better one at Mother's. Oh, you're going there? Well, where else do you expect a woman to go in a crisis like this? I should think that steak was about done, William. Oh, I'll give it another hour or two to make sure. Of course. <laughs> of course, I realise this is a painful moment for both of you. But as you say, we shan't make it any easier by dragging it out. Uh, true, true. Goodbye, Bill. I forgive you everything. And I hope we shall always be good friends. Goodbye, Victoria. I hope this will not be by any means your last marriage. When everything is settled, you must come and dine with us. I'm sure you'll find that Lester has the best wines and cigars that money can buy. I'm sure of it. Goodbye. And now, Freddy, it's your turn. Now that there's nothing between us, you might give me back that tie pin I gave you. Oh. Oh, right -o. Here you are. And there was a cigarette case. Take it. There. They say jewellery has gone up enormously in value since the war. I shall give Lester a cigarette case as a wedding present. You always do, Victoria. Men like it. <laughs> Goodbye, Freddie dear. I shall always have a pleasant recollection of you. Goodbye, Victoria. Would you like me to call you a taxi? No, thanks. I think the exercise will do my figure good. Bye-bye. Ah, a wonderful woman. I shall never regret having married her. Now, let's have lunch. I wish I look forward to it as much as you do. My dear chap, has that affecting scene taken away your appetite? It's not the appetite I'm doubtful about, it's the steak. Oh, don't worry about that. I'll just go and dish it up. Devil! It won't come up. That's your problem. Oh, well, we'll just have to eat it out of the frying pan. Shall I carve it? Please. Uh, uh, I, I can't even dent it. Well, why don't you do something, you fool? Shall I go and fetch my little hatchet? There's someone at the kitchen door. I I'll see. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, what's this? Uh, what can I do for you, lady? Does Mrs. Frederick Lowndes live in? Uh, in a manner of speaking. This is for her, from the Ritz Hotel. What's that? Walk right in, my boy, and put that great heavy basket of food on the table. Food? With Mr. Lester Payton's compliments. It's a complete luncheon. I was told to give the basket to the lady personally. Oh, that's all right, my boy. If the lady's not here, I'm to take it back again. Uh, she's just out in the hall, I'll tell her. Victoria, my darling, that kind Mr. Lester Payton has sent you a little light refreshment from the Ritz. She says, how sweet, leave it with us. But, uh, but... Here's half a crown for you, my lad. Now you hop it quick. Oh, thank you, sir. Thanks very much, sir. Now you can eat the steak if you like. I'm going to eat Victoria's luncheon. What a dashed unscrupulous thing to do. I'll join you. <laughs> now, what's the dish? Ah, chicken and casserole. Mm, that sounds good. Here, give me that champagne and I'll open it. Pate de foie gras? Good. Oh, yes. Caviar? Hmm? No, smoked salmon. Stout fellow, Mr. Lester Payton. This is a regular beano. <laughs> yeah, how's that cork going? Half minute, it's just coming. Got the glasses? Uh, here. Well, this is what I call a nice little snack. 
Dear Victoria, she was a good sort. In her way. But give me pâté de foie gras. <coughs> Pass over your glass. You are. I'm as hungry as a trooper. Uh-huh. Ah, there. Now, before we start, I want you to drink a toast. <laughs> I'll drink to anything. Victoria's third husband. Heaven help him. And for us, liberty. Liberty! <sighs> so ends our Caltex play, The Third Husband. In a moment, we will give you tonight's cast and tell you about next week's presentation in the Caltex Theatre. The Third Husband was adapted for radio by David Netheim from the play Home and Beauty by Somerset Maugham. In the starring roles, you heard Margaret Christensen as Victoria, Alan White as William, and Leonard Bullen as Frederick. <laughs> The supporting cast was as follows. Lester Payton was played by David Eady, A.B. Rahm, Ron Whelan, Miss McMorency, Therese Desmond, Mrs. Shuttleworth, Catherine Neal, Taylor, Dorothea Dunstan. <laughs> now, this is your compere, Rick Hutton, bidding you good night on behalf of your hosts, Caltex Oil, marketers of Caltex Super Gasoline and Caltex Gasoline, the world famous RPM 1030 Special Motor Oil, and Marfec Lubrication.